Hello, welcome to Lotro 101, session three, entitled, You're Going on an Adventure! Because everybody likes to quote that uh, line from the Hobbit movie as made by Peter Jackson. <clears throat> and, you know, post the meme of, um, what's his face? Not Bilbo. Thinking of Martin Freeman. I was thinking of the character name. Uh, I was thinking of the actor name as well, uh, with the with the contract behind him running up uh, running up the lane. Anyway, uh, let's move on to our first slide of the day. Um, I will recommend today's class um, if you have uh, th this one's going to be a, a slide heavy class. So if you're used to Professor Corey getting through a third of a slide. It, we're going to go to ludicrous speed today because I have a lot of slides. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of in-game stuff. I'm going to show a couple of things that we'll be discussing today, mainly because a lot of it's easier to see than to talk about necessarily. Uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, my co-pilot, uh, my co-worker, is right here. Hi, come here. This is my co-worker. Because I know half of you are here to see him. So here's a question I'd like to throw to the audience. Um, by the way, I also highly recommend you may want to take notes. Uh, if there's some stuff that you want to remind yourself about. There's also a feature in Twitch called Twitch Markers. Some of you may be able to put them down to remind yourself of a particular piece that we're talking about. It's like, oh, I need to go look at that. Um, however, you can always just you know, watch the video later and fast forward and rewind as necessary to find the stuff you're looking for. So, let's get into our topic of the day. And again, I'm going to throw a lot of terms at you, and I do apologize. We're going to define what they mean, because a lot of folks who normally play video games will know pretty much a lot of what I'm talking about, simply because you play video games. You're used to the jargon. So, we're going to throw some jargon at you. Define what we mean when we say, oh, this thing or that thing, and then we'll go on from there and get into Lotro-specific stuff. So first of all, boop, basic MMO style glossary right here. So we're going to start off the top of the list. Aggro stands for aggravation. Aggro basically means somebody is attacking you. Like aggro is a measure of how much the bad guys want to get at you versus somebody else who's with you. If you're running by yourself, you're going to get all the aggro yourself because there's nobody to take it away from you. One of the game mechanics is where certain character classes are expected to get that away from you so you can do your thing without getting killed. <clears throat> and Twitch markers is something fairly new. Uh, it lets you uh, basically leave yourself a little note. Uh, it may not be available to all users. It may just be available only to like editors of a channel or something. All right, so aggro is basically how much do these guys want to kill your character? And that's uh, a mechanic that certain classes uh, can manage uh, to help keep it away from other classes. And, you know, there's, there's more in-depth discussions about what aggro is. Sometimes gamers may joke and talk about wife aggro, kid aggro, cat aggro. That means basically something else is distracting them from you know, hanging out with you online or doing whatever. The next term is binding. Um, that basically means something you acquire in the game may be bound to you in a fashion, which means you can't give it away to somebody else. You can't sell it to another player. You can't put it up on the auction house. We'll talk about auction houses later. There are different kinds of binding. Um, and you see the initials there. BTC stands for bind to a character. That means once you acquire it, that character is the only character that can have it. You may be able to sell it to like uh, a vendor, but you can't give it to another character on your own account. You can't give it to another player on another account. So bind to character. Uh, BOA stands for bind on acquire, which means... Um, <clears throat> When you pick that item up, it binds to either your account 
or to your character and the item should tell you which it is. If it just says bind on acquire, you assume bind to character. If it says bind to account on acquire, that goes to the third term, which is PTA, bind to account. Something that's bound to your account, your specific character can use it or you can give it to one of your alternate characters on the same account, but you can't give it to another player on another account. <clears throat> BIS is a term you may only hear uh, when you get toward the higher reaches of the game to what's called the end game. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, BIS stands for best in slot, which means it's the best piece of gear for that particular item, like the best piece of armor or the best weapon or the best whatever. And generally, there that's something that's more commonly used by the top of the, the, the cream of the crop, as it were. You may hear people talking about bosses or mini bosses. A boss, unlike the bosses you know, of the brigands in the Shire, you know, Sharky was a boss, you know, whatever. Um, a boss typically means somebody in a quest or in a large instance, which is a certain kind of quest, or in a raid, which is a really big series of fights or whatnot, is like the person at the end or the creature at the end that you have to defeat to complete the, you know, that event. A mini boss is somebody along the way. So if there's a big boss, a mini boss is like here, 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 like mini, 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 boom. Uh, and that's a term you can see in other video games as well. It's not, none of these are really Lotro specific and that's by design. Uh, you may hear people talking about buffs or debuffs. A buff is something that makes you better. A debuff is not. A debuff is going to be something that's going to take away something from your character. Uh, so buffs will make you maybe have more health, which we call morale, or it may be something that makes you more powerful, like makes your character hit 5% better than before. A debuff is the opposite. It's going to make your character not as healthy and not as powerful. Uh, CC, you may hear people talk about CCs. They are not credit cards. In this case, it's crowd control. There are some classes that are able to uh, use crowd control abilities to make sure that you don't have 20 bad guys coming at you at once. You may only have to deal with two or three. The others will wait until a certain event happens and then more and more. It's basically a means of making sure you don't get mobbed and run over like a tsunami. All right, you may hear people talk about classic or vanilla. We're not talking about classic or vanilla Coke. We're talking about the game as it was 14, 15 years ago. In this case, 13 years ago. Uh, classic refers to uh, an experience where you're doing the old content. It may or may not be exactly the same as it used to be. Vanilla typically means the game you're playing the game exactly the same way as it was in 2007. Neither of those exist anymore in Lotro, but you may hear the term, you may hear people talk about how they want that as an experience. World of Warcraft had to hire an entirely separate dev team in order to create their WoW Classic experience, which is an actual, we went to get the old code, find out it didn't work anymore, and we had to fix it. They spent a lot of time, a lot of money, paid a lot of people to make that happen. Standing Stone does not have that many people on staff, much less a whole separate team to do that. So you'll probably never see Lord of the Rings Online the way it was in 2007 ever again. It's just too much work to do. All right. <clears throat> you may hear people talk about critting or to crit or something was critted. Oh, I critted on that. You may also hear it referred to as procking. Um, it's not... A reference to prog rock sorry uh, it means a critical hit which means um, in like let's say you play tabletop dice you know tabletop games you you rolled your the roll that determines how well you did was a super success it, you know in Pokemon terms it was super effective right uh, and so basically you want stuff to crit as long as it's not attacking you right you want to crit you don't want them to crit <laughs> okay, you may uh, hear people talk about currency. Uh, there is a slide for that here in a few minutes, but currency is basically in-game money 
or in-game tokens that you get that you can use to trade for things. Uh, we'll talk about what kinds of currency there are in the game. Crafting as well means basically you succeed in making a better copy of what you're trying to make. <clears throat> All right. You may hear people talk about dailies and how, oh my God, I don't want to do these dailies again. A daily is a quest or an event that you can do once a day. Um, pretty typically, once you complete a certain segment of content, it allows you to repeat certain bits of it over and over and over again to grind currency. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned Endgame. Endgame is basically the upper echelons of the game. Um, it Endgame is not a term... Well, I personally don't like Endgame as a term for MMOs, per se, because they don't end. It's like the song that never ends. They keep going. But... Generally, in term, most MMOs will refer to the end game as where the game currently has the highest tier of content, like the highest raids, the best gear, the most competitive players, the you know the cream of the crop. They're playing end game content. All right, you're gonna hear people talk about experience or XP, just like playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. As you go through the game, your character acquires experience. And that goes through, and as you gain experience, you level up. And as you get, you know, level up, you get more powerful. Your character is better at doing what they're doing. They might get, uh, uh, they might get additional abilities. Um, eventually, you'll reach uh, something. We'll talk to a little bit about level cap, so we'll get to that. Uh, you may in, ex in experience, you may also hear it referred to as EXP. I just call it XP. One less letter to type all the time. You may hear people talk about exploits or exploiting. First rule of exploits is like Fight Club is don't talk about it. Uh, Standing Stone take in most game companies take a very dim view of people discussing exploits publicly. Now, what is an exploit? An exploit is where you basically find a way to play part or all of the game in a way that's not intended by the developers. We're not talking, oh, this is a cool little shortcut I found to doing something. We're talking, I'm cheating. Basically, exploits are cheating. So put on ethical mode for a minute. Get serious for just a second. An exploit would be something like if you're in a high-end raid the intention of the developers that you have to fight through the entire raid to get to the end and beat the bad guy at the end and, you know, loot his corpse, right? Well, an exploit would allow somebody to not have to do any of that, go right to the end, and loot the boss. Or it would be a case where there's limits on how often you can do those sorts of quests, like... You can only do the raid and get loot once a week, for example. Right? An exploit would be something where players figure out, oh, hey, we went in again and we got more loot. That's not the way it's supposed to happen in most cases. So somebody who willingly goes in there, willfully goes in there and does it again and again and again, and it gets all this really cool stuff, that's cheating. And that's... It's a big topic of debate amongst gamers some gamers will say oh hey um too bad you left that in there that's your fault but it's like you know what if i leave my door unlocked that's not an invitation to come in to steal my stuff so as a rule i can tell you standing stone prefers the following methods for dealing with exploits if you discover one don't tell anybody don't try to replicate it it's like, you know, hacking in real life. It's like if you find a bug in a program, you go and quietly contact the developers uh, through the, the forums, in this case, help.standingstonegames.com, uh, and report a bug. Say, hey, I found this problem. I think it might be an exploit. You leave it up to them to decide yes or no. And then don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Just basically don't tell anybody other than the developers. Keep it to yourself. Don't publish it. Don't promote it. Don't explain, hey, this is what I found. You'll get yourself in trouble with that. <clears throat> no, I'm just saying. You may, people see, you may see the term FTP uh, in, or F2P uh, or free to play. That means the game, you don't have to buy the game to play it. Come on, Fifi. Come here. 
This is free to meow. So free to play, basically, again, you don't have to pay to buy a copy of Lord of the Rings online. You just have to download it um, right off of Lotro.com, as we explained in Lesson 1. <clears throat> You'll hear people talking about gear. Uh, gear is basically the stuff your character is wearing. It includes things like rings, earrings, uh, your weapon, uh, your, your various pieces of armor. These things make your character more powerful or they make your character look a specific way. Uh, your gear is your life. Uh, with bad gear, you may not get invited to groups to do certain hard content. You may uh, find that your gear is, uh, is better than it's supposed to be. But for the most part, gear is uh, the stuff you acquire in the game to equip on your character. Like your gloves, your boots, your chest piece, your your helmet. Uh, we touched on this term before. We mentioned grinding. Grinding is the bane of our existence. However, as with any MMO, uh, grinding is a way of life. Uh, grinding basically means doing the same content over and over and over again. Generally, it feels like make work. It's really boring, but you have to do it to get to where you need to go. Um, if you choose, uh, not to support the game financially, which is entirely your choice, and one of the official Lotro streamers by the nickname of Big Ed Mustafa does that, um, you're gonna do a lot of grinding, because one of the things about a free-to-play account is that you're paying, uh, if you decide to pay money, you're paying more for convenience to shortcut some of the grind than it is, um, for anything else. So if you want to say, I want to unlock this particular racial trait for my character, we'll talk about those here in a little bit, then you're going to have to do certain things like kill 100 whatevers to unlock that thing. That's called a grind. Some grinding uh, takes just a couple of hours. Some grinding takes a while. Um, generally, if players complain about certain grinds long enough, uh, the dev team will actually do something about it. Like, uh, there is a quest in Rohan, a series of quests to help rebuild a burnt town, and those quests used to take you a whole month to complete if you did them every single day. Now it takes you, like, you can do it in a single couple of days. No big deal. You'll hear people talk about hardcore players or casual players. And there's a spectrum of what is hardcore and what is casual. In basic terms, hardcore is a player who invests a lot of time and frequently is also pushing the envelope in terms of end game content. Um, you might hear somebody call mention hardcore raiders. There are a subsection of players that will spend like three or four hours a day, multiple days a week, like enough time to consider it to be a job. Um, to work on completing a raid, which are intended to be very difficult. You hear people talk about casuals, sometimes disparagingly referring to us as filthy casuals. They are folks who are not pushing the envelope. They're just playing the game for funsies. However, a casual player can certainly invest a lot of time and or money in the game. Um, <clears throat> you may hear people talking about catering to the hardcore raiders or catering to the casuals. Ignore people who you refer to either group disparagingly. I mean, seriously. Uh, if somebody is being rude about it, then they're just being rude. Uh, the game has content for both uh, sets of players and every spectrum in between. No big deal. All right. Uh, we talked about instances, raiding, raids and raiding. Um, instances are separate pieces of content that you do with just a small group of people. That group of people can range from uh, three people up to 12. Um, I think there was a 20, an option for 24 in a raid. I think you can have up to 24 players in a raid. But most raids go up to 12. And this is basically content that's set aside. It's supposed to be very difficult. Uh, and it's intended to basically, you know, be a test of how well you can play the game, right? Jesse D, hi, my friend. How you doing? 
Uh, you'll hear people complain about lag all the time. Uh, lag is basically uh, the game is uh, acting up where you're, let's say you're running around and your character seems to be running in place, then all of a sudden they snap forward. Um, or things are running slow, like you click on um, you click on the mailbox to open up your mail and it takes forever to load. That's called lag. Um, and you can actually, there, there's a feature that you can turn on to show you your connection status to see if the lag is caused by the connection between you and the game. Uh, that is actually called latency. That is a feature of the internet. And I'll put my internet service provider 16 year veteran uh, hat on here for a minute. Latency is going to be worse for our players who are not in the, in the United States of America simply because the data centers where the game servers are, are in New Jersey. So, and this is unfortunate for our European players especially, they used to have, uh, their servers used to be physically located in, in Europe. So they had much better uh, connections to the servers these days. They're all in New Jersey, so we all have to suffer based on... Um, how good your internet can get you your data to and from New Jersey. <clears throat> and there are certain things that you can do on your end that can cause lag as well. Um, your game will perform better if you turn certain, uh, certain of those features off that we showed you the graphic settings. If you turn them down, your game will perform better and you'll experience less lag you will experience more lag if you're in places where there's a lot of other players because your local version of the game, your local client, is having to load all the data from all these other players. Uh, that's also one of the reasons why the game generally doesn't let you have more than 50 people in the same particular area without causing something called a layer. Uh, and a layer is basically the same like piece of brie, for example, Bree and Minas Tirith are pretty, pretty, they have pretty bad reputations for lag. Um, I can't wait till the wedding of Aragorn and Arwen to see what happens with that. However, they will create a new layer and any new people who go into that area will show up in an identical version of it, but it won't have all the same players. Um, <clears throat> lag can also be caused by other people on your internet. Now, I'm not talking necessarily other people in your neighborhood, though, depending on your internet service provider, that is a possibility. But let's say you're in a house and your, your internet service plan only has a certain amount of bandwidth on it. Um, for example, my uh, ISP that I used to work for, I get 200 megabits per second down and 10 up. That means... I generally have a pretty decent connection for playing video games. That's not bad. The 10 up is all obviously more critical than that. But if you have internet from the Stone Age, heaven help you if you're on dial-up, you can play Lotro on dial-up. I have done it once. It was terrible. Things run very slow. And there's nothing Standing Stone can do about it. All they can really do is improve the quality of the client so that when it runs on your computer, it's more efficient, uh, which is one of the things they did with the 64-bit client we discussed in our first lesson, is they made that second client to help use more memory on your computer instead of crashing like it used to do. Um, but they can't fix your internet service plan, they can't fix your internet service provider, they can't fix anything for the folks in the EU who now have to deal with sending their traffic over to New Jersey where they didn't have to before. There's not much they can do about that. <clears throat> or weak Wi-Fi. By the way, as a gamer, I highly recommend don't play on Wi-Fi unless you utterly have to because there's such a thing called Wi-Fi interference and if you have too many neighbors on Wi-Fi in your small area, if you see more than like seven or eight Wi-Fi networks around you, you're going to have problems with your internet. So, there's some stuff that you yourself can do to help fix stuff. There's just stuff that's out of anybody's hands and you just kind of have to live with it we mentioned the levels and there's also something called a level cap it ties into experience as you continually gain experience your character increases in level currently at this time lotro has 130 levels uh, by comparison world of warcraft has 120 so yay we beat world of warcraft <laughs> but the level cap is 130 at this time 
And what's going to happen is once you hit that level cap, your character can no longer gain experience. There are other things you can gain, other kinds of experience. We're, we're going to talk about those when we talk about those particular systems in the future. But basically, your character can't go beyond level 130 at this time. Uh, that may rise in the future. Probably will. You know, uh, maybe with the next expansion coming next year, we won't know. Um, but the higher your level, the the better you are to face the content that you are in, unless you keep going to higher level areas as well. Um, level is also important in terms of visiting the game. One of the things I know that a lot of us Lord of the Rings nerds like to do is we want to go see all these cool places in Middle Earth. Your problem is those places are based in zones that are of a certain level. Bree, um, if you can hear in the background, my character is actually parked uh, on the border of the Barrow Downs overlooking Bree. Because I wanted to show you a really cool image of Bree here in a minute. Um, and that's a pretty low level area. But if you took a level 5 to Bree and you wandered around any of the mobs there, you're going to get yourself killed pretty easily. <clears throat> so you want to be very careful about what levels the areas are that you're going to like Minas Tirith was added to the game only a few years ago okay more like six or seven years ago but it's still a fairly high level place um, you can visit there but it's always at a you're running a risk of getting yourself run over by bad guys so if you want to be careful about that. Uh, you may hear people talking about looting. We talked about looting corpses. That's one of the things uh, you do in this game is you kill something, you loot it. Um, so you hear about loot, looting, and loot boxes are something slightly different. Um, looting, bad guys that you defeat is where you get gear sometimes, you get money, you get currency. Um, a loot box is something different. A loot box is something that you get that will open up and assuming you have a key and that ties into the store and that's a whole separate conversation but a loot box is something you get that you can unlock with a key that you can buy you can't grind them in game anymore and you get stuff and you don't get to pick what's in this within that loot box you may hear people talk about lobbies or noobs or newbies uh, a lobby basically means a low level character right uh, and depending on where you are in the game, uh, I would say most folks would consider a lobby to be a character under level 50, which is a little bit ironic because when the game originally started out, originally launched, uh, the game is, uh, started out with a level cap was 50. The level cap has increased over the years. Loot boxes are something very few people like. I actually like loot boxes. I just don't buy them too often. I, I don't, I don't buy into the whole loot box argument. All right, you may hear people talking about their mains or their alts. The main is the primary character you choose to play. Uh, I'm currently on my alternate character. That's what an alt is, an alternate character. Uh, and some of us are what you may hear referred to as an altaholic. No, I don't have 20 characters per server. Well, not all of them. Um... You may also hear something referred to as an off main, which is basically a character you spend a lot of time on, but it's not your number one, right? It's the first, it's the second among equals, right? <laughs> yeah, lobbies for, for example, Jesse in chat says lobbies for use generally let characters under 30. Um, but yeah, generally somewhere below 50 is a good place for uh, a lobby character to be. Because, you know, when you have 100 more levels to play. Uh, you may hear people refer to something called minimaxing, minimize, maximizing. That's generally for the folks who spend more time trying to get, it, it's like the difference between driving your car to work, not that we can right now because of, you know, real life incidents, versus being a NASCAR driver or a Formula One driver and having your crew get the tweak that car the best it can so you can get every last iota of power out of it right 
That's what min-maxing is. That's for the folks who want to get their character so fine-tuned that they get the maximum potential out of it. And this goes back to the hardcore and uh, casual thing. I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I'm too lazy for that. I, I can't min-max to save my life, and that is fine. But there are folks who do, and they enjoy it, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with min-maxing. There's nothing wrong with being hardcore. There's nothing wrong with being casual. Just don't be a jerk about it to anybody in either direction. doesn't matter. It's like, be kind. <laughs> you may hear people talk about multi-boxing. Multi-boxing is not against the rules of uh, Lotro. Uh, multi-boxing is basically one player with multiple accounts working together to do certain things. Now, in most cases, multi-boxing is not against the rules. Multiboxing is only against the rules when you go back and talk about exploits and cheating. If you're using uh, multiple characters to cheat the game, then that's against the rules. However, if you are uh, just multiboxing, for example, to play uh, as a musical band, which you can do in Locho. In fact, we're going to have a special guest next week to play for us, which I probably need to talk to them because I got my dates wrong and I told them it would be the week after next. So I need to go talk to TD later tonight. Um, but multi-boxing, there's nothing wrong with it. And friend, our, our friend Fibro Jedi, uh, whose basic beginner's guide I link at the end of every show, uh, he multi-boxes to get his characters through content as well. It's fine. Uh, you may hear people talk about patches or hot fixes. A patch is where the developers take the games down, add a little patch, and then, you know, restart the worlds. Generally, there, is, there isn't one every week. Um, there is a weekly restart that helps deal with the lag. But um, if they put a patch, they'll have patch notes. You'll see patch notes. Uh, we discussed what patch notes were uh, last week. Um... <clears throat> A hotfix is where they patch the game, but they don't take the work. They don't turn the game off to fix it before. Um, so think of a patch like um, a Windows update. You have to reboot your computer. However, a hotfix is where you update an app, but you don't have to restart your computer to do it. Right? Same basic concept. Going back to loot boxes, you may hear people fling the phrase P2W or pay to win. And there are many different opinions perfectly valid about what is and what isn't pay to win. My personal concept of pay to win is where you can buy the best raid gear for real money without having to do the raid. To me, that's pay to win. This game has a lot of pay for convenience. And the loot box, as we mentioned earlier, is kind of skirting that a little bit because you can get gear in loot boxes, but they're not going to be the best in slot that we mentioned earlier, right? Um, so some people think you know use pay to win in a very disparaging term, and for most for the most part, I ain't rich. I don't want to be able to throw a I throw a ton of money at uh, at Standing Stone Games. I'm happy to do so because there's stuff I like. It also goes back to, I'm lazy, right? I don't have time to, I don't have the time or the patience to sit around and grind all the time to get stuff. So if it's something where I feel like, well, you know what? I want to have a minstrel uh, at 120, at level 120. I'll buy, I'll, I'll buy one of the uh, character boosts that comes with a certain level of gear, but I can play a naturally leveled character as well. I'm not paying to win. I'm just paying for convenience. You may hear people talk about pots. And they're not talking about the um, the weed that is controlled in some places and not controlled in other places. Uh, what they're referring to is potions. Where potion, the, the word potion wasn't used a lot in the lore. But that's a gaming term. So you can uh, acquire uh, potions that can do various things such as uh, increase your morale, make sure your character is more healthy, increase the power or the wrath of your character, uh, or you know, there, there's all these potions that do various things. And I'm just going to tell you, Lotro people, right now, you're so glad you don't deal with potions on, don't play DDO because 
you think we have bad potions. Yeah, they have like so many different kinds. So we're, we're actually pretty good about it. Yeah, there's uh, potions that help, uh, you know, help you resist certain bad things that uh, the bad guys do to you. Uh, they're very handy. Some of them have what's called a cooldown. A cooldown is basically you activate something, you make it happen, and then you can't do it again for a certain period of time. And that's part of the gameplay is deciding how long you... Can you use this thing now? Is it going to be more advent? It's part of the strategy. It's like, is it more advantageous to use it now and let it, you know? Or can you wait a little bit longer, right? You may hear people talk about pugs. They are not talking about the dogs. A pug stands for pickup groups. You may hear used as a verb pugging. I went pugging the other day. It's not inappropriate. It's basically you decide to do group content with people who aren't in your usual circle of friends. Uh, the opposite of uh, running with a pickup group is running with a static group, right? It's like you always run with the same three people every week. It's like the four of you just go and rampage across the landscape. That's not a pickup group. Um, so you'll hear people talk about pugs. Sometimes, again, disparagingly because sometimes the experience is not very pleasant, depending on the people in the group, because you don't know who these people are. You don't know. Maybe you don't agree on political things maybe somebody says something sexist that's the danger of playing with a pickup group on the other hand one of my very best friends uh one of my fellow lotro moderators um lotro stream moderators met her boyfriend in a pickup group uh in lotro one day she was out trying to do a quest and he and his friends were doing that quest so they invited her to the group and they apparently got along so well they kept talking and communicating and you know years later now they're they're like this it's so adorable hello kitty all right you may hear people uh drop the acronyms pve pvp or in lotro's case pvmp pve stands for player versus environment that's basically you playing the game but not playing versus other players which is what pvp stands for uh lotro has a specific kind of pvp called pvmp and the m stands for monster uh pv it's player versus monster player we'll discuss pvmp on its own separate slide later on you'll hear people talking about quests you'll hear people talk about epic or book quests uh and also side quests so a quest is the basic gameplay. It's like you go, you talk to somebody, they say, can you do this for me? You go do that thing for them. That's a quest. Very simple. Um, this is not like, you know, Frodo's quest to Mordor. That would be like an entire thing. Kill 10 rats, really. <laughs> and there are quests. Uh, the epic quest in Lotro terms is the main game storyline. It's referred to as the epic quest through pretty much everything up to Mordor. And then in Mordor, they change the name and say they call it the Black Book of Mordor is the epic quest during that story. And I just finished that last night. Oh, my God. <clears throat> a book quest also refers to that. It doesn't mean a quest that is taken from the pages of the Tolkien novels. Okay. However... The terminology, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that here in a little bit. The terminology basically is an homage to how Tolkien presented. A side quest is basically a quest that doesn't, it's not really important. Um, you do it if you want to do every, like, every single quest in the game, which is something called a completionist, also known as somebody who would be slightly in, uh, obsessed and insane, I don't know. Um, Right now, for example, Professor Corey is on a completionist journey through uh, Lotro with his Grifflet character on Fridays on the Lotro channel. Um, so the side questing is are, are definitely the ones that you mainly do if you want to do everything, or you might need to work on additional objectives in an area. Like you want to, again, grind currency because you get currency. You get stuff for doing quests. Um, one thing that's Lotro specific, you may hear people talk about quest packs, game updates and expansions. Uh, a quest pack is, um, certain areas of the game that 
if you're free to play, you have to buy to access the quests in that area. You can still go to those areas physically. You can take your character there. You can still kill things. You just won't get the quests. You won't get the currency for completing those quests or any gear. Um, it is possible to just kill your way through the entire Middle Earth and level a character up. Why you'd want to do that, I don't know. Because the quests are so good. The quests are the story. Um... Everybody, all accounts free to play, uh, up to free to play, pretty much can get to level 20. Play all the content. Uh, Jesse, help me out here. Uh, Lone Lands, I believe, is included. The Lone Lands, or is not. It is included, okay. So basically, you can do all of the game content up to the Lone Lands, you know, like the Forsaken Inn, uh, Weathertop areas. Basically, to the last bridge, you know, where uh, Glorfindel put the barrel on the bridge. You can do all the quests up to that point and pay zero dollars. You don't have to buy anything, um, any quest packs or any additional quests. You can do all the quests in those areas. However, once you get past those areas into places like the Troll Shaws, the North Downs, uh, even Dip, you have to buy those quest packs. Now, if you're a VIP player, you get them automatically. But if you're not, you have to buy them, and we'll tell you how you do that later on. A game update is where they add more quest packs to a game. It It's basically not an expansion for the most part. It's like, okay, we're adding uh, the Veils of Ondu into the game. That's going to be a quest pack. And then you buy that quest pack and you do those quests. You can still go to those areas, even without the quest pack. But, you know, you, you, it's a game update. And you'll see them, uh, they'll publish them as, like, game update, like, 24 or game update 23 or something like that. Finally, there are those expansions. Those are very rare. There's actually, um, there's the base game. We, we discussed this base game. Uh, and there's seven expansions at this time. There will be an eighth one next year. Uh, and those expansions, uh, everybody has to buy. Even VIPs and lifetimers like me still have to buy expansions to be able to access those quests in those areas. And in a couple of cases, a couple of expansions give you a couple of classes for free. Like the Minds of Moria expansion gives you the Runekeeper and the Warden classes as part of that price. So you don't have to, you know, buy them separately if you, if you didn't want the expansion for some reason. You may hear people talking about resing or resurrection. In Tolkien lore, you don't actually really die and come back unless you're somebody like Glorfindel. So, for the most part, we call it being defeated, but you'll hear gamers talk about resing. Hey, can I get a res? It means your character has been defeated and you're trying not to um, uh, have your character revive at a place called a rally circle. If you, anybody who's ever played World of Warcraft, it's a spirit healer. You know. <clears throat> Are there any real differences from service? Tomas, that's a good question. We actually went over that a couple of lessons ago. So I probably recommend uh, maybe uh, reviewing the very first class because I did talk server types and what they meant. <clears throat> Uh, Edith, actually, the legendary servers are currently level 85. They have Riders of Rohan activated now. Yep. All right, you may hear of something called RNG. It stands for Random Name Generator. You may also hear the slightly uh, profane uh, and a blasphemous term of RNGesus. I personally don't use it because I find it disrespectful. But RNG is basically the game roll rolls a die an internal random number to determine what the results are. And that number, a low number means a f not so good result. A high number means a better result. Um, and people will complain about RNG, especially in terms of loot boxes, because you don't get to pick from the loot box. You get told what you get when you unlock it. So RNG is sometimes the bane of our existence, but it is how a lot of the features of the game are controlled. So what folks are talking about in chat right now is an initiative, and I uh, threw a question in the uh, Discord, 
the Signa Mew Discord in the Lotro 101 channel, asking if people wanted me to teach more of this class, um, to speed it up, basically, because right now, Standing Stone has unlocked all the quest content for all accounts until the end of April. And by the time this class would have normally been done, our last class would have been like the first weekend, uh, our final class would have been the, the weekend, the first weekend of May. So it doesn't actually help people. So I'm, I'm thinking about it. So if you have any thoughts about that, please go to Discord, toss your uh, comments there in the Lotro 101 channel in the Signum U Discord. And if you're not already in our Discord, um, let me do the exclamation point thing here. And you are more than welcome to join. Anybody can join. I just, you know, ask you. It is a scholarly Discord, so uh, please keep it uh, family appropriate. There are a couple of youngsters who wander around the channels. Ethelod. Uh, so basically, keep it family friendly uh, for the most part. Keep it respectful. This is an offshoot of an actual series for Real Z's University. So. We're a little bit more highbrow than that. Um, not too many, uh, you know, inappropriate jokes. All right. You may hear us refer to SSG or a dev. SSG is Standing Stone Games. They are the developers of this game. Uh, and that's what dev stands for. It stands for developers. Now, there is, you know, people say, well, the community manager is not a developer. Nope, that's not right. He is. Uh, anybody who works for Standing Stone is a developer. And as we mentioned, uh, when it comes to if you get contact from somebody who claims to be a developer, if they're in-game, their character will have a plus sign in front of their name because the rest of us can't use plus signs. All right, you may hear people talk about stats. That goes back to the min-maxing thing we talked about. Stats are statistics about your character, what they look like. Um, you know, bigger numbers in certain things mean, you know, better things. We'll go into stats a little bit more later. Theory crafting also goes into that in min maxing. Theory crafting is the practice of figuring out what something does in relation to something else. Like, what does this particular stat do for this particular skill? What is this item? How does this item affect, you know, if I put this on, do I get better results with this? So, theory crafting is uh, a lot of math, some Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and basically a lot of testing. And there are some fake folks who basically spend a very lot of their time and effort in the game trying to figure out the best way to gear up their character or the best results or, hey, this particular skill says it's supposed to do this, but it's actually doing this other thing. And they can find that out and find out, you know, how things mesh together uh, and they can craft the best uh, experience for themselves. You may hear people talk about their tunes. You know, it came from, you know, Roger Rabbit. People you know, had tunes. Um, some other people hate that term because it's not serious enough and prefer to use the term avatar. The avatar or a tune is your character. Um, like our friend Chromite hates the term tune and prefers to use avatar. Avatar actually as a phrase to refer to a player's character was coined by Mr. Richard Garriott, one of the first um, um, tourist tourists in space. His dad actually was on the original Skylab for reals. Was a real ash well, I wouldn't say a real astronaut, but Garriott himself spent time on the International Space Station. Uh, young Mr. Garriott, and was also the creator of uh, a game called Ultima Online under his persona of Lord British, and um, he also now has a game called Shroud of the Avatar, so, you know, self-referential there. Uh, you may hear about trolls and trolling. These are not Tom, Bert, and William, or cave trolls. Trolls are basically people in the community who choose to be mean. Um, basically, they will try... It's like trolls on the internet trying to incite you into bad behavior or trying... To just basically being rude, being jerks. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll talk about trolling my friends. That's where you're teasing your friends. You know, we, we kind of troll Professor Corey about how the fact that he only gets through one slide per show, and now you can troll me about the fact that we're almost an hour in, and I'm still on the first slide. There's a lot of definitions here. But 
basically, if you're trolling your friends, there, there's already a relationship established there. But actual trolls in game are folks who will like, for example, they'll go into world chat and just drop down something political just to make you so mad, just to get you going. And you know, uh, they do it just to basically cause dissent and cause chaos, and they like to see the world burn. And those people can go jump in their own fires for all I care. Finally, the last word on my basic glossary is the word zone. What's a zone? A zone is basically like, we mentioned names like the Lowlands. That's a zone. The North Downs is a zone. It's basically a smaller subsection of the game. Um, <clears throat> you may also refer hear people refer to referring to zoning into an area or you zone into an instance. It's basically your character appearing, in, you know, going to that area and appearing in that content. So, first slide down, next slide going. So, what types of content do we have in Lotro? Look at all this fun stuff we can do. We've got landscape quests. These are commonly um, not... Landscape quests can be uh, epic quests or they can be a side quest. Basically, they're quests that you just ride up to. You find the person who says, hey, go do this thing for me. And then you ride off or run off to wherever you need to do whatever. Um... Those are not instances. Landscape and instances are two separate things. Instances are segregated content. Like anybody can ride up to you. Run, you can run across any number of players while you're doing a landscape quest because you're in the op what's called the open world. Everybody's around you. Uh, but an instance is segregated content, one to 24 players in that separate instance, and you're all doing the same piece of content. Uh, instances can be referred to as fellowship quests, but instances are basically often you get better stuff out of instances than you do landscape quests. All right. Skirmishes are a special kind of content that open up at level 20 and skirmishes are basically you go in and you have a very set, it, it, a skirmish is an instance, so the group rules apply of how many people you can have with you. Um, and actually, I think all of these, I think most of these we have, um, we're not going to go deep dive each of these because I have slides for most of these. So skirmishes are special set pieces of you're defending Tuckborough, you're defending the Prancing Pony, you're attacking the orcs in, in Moria or whatever. Uh, then we mentioned raids earlier. Those are the big honking pieces of, okay, you've got one to five bosses to, you know, defeat. You get really good gear. Hardest content. You need more players. Big time stuff. Once you hit level 10, something called epic or big battles opens up as a separate piece of content. None of it's required, though there's some of it required for the epic story. Same with skirmishes. There are no raids required for any of the epic main story of the game. You do not have to raid to play every piece of content of the main story of the game, which is one of the things Standing Stone has always, you know, back in their day when they were still Turbine, they were always making sure that every person who didn't want to necessarily do group content would be able to play the main story. I mean, there, there is story in raids, but it's not required. It's like a, maybe a little epilogue here or a little something there. But epic or big battles, those are very specific. Um, those are um, book stuff from the actual books where you're playing like the Battle of Helm's Deep is the main one and the, the Battle for Minas Tirith is the other one. We'll talk about them in a little bit more. Mounted combat. Once you get to Rohan, you get something called a war steed and then you can fight people from horseback and it's a pain in the butt. But there's also fun that P had. We mentioned PvMP earlier. That's player versus monster player. In Lotro, for the most part, you cannot play a member of the bad guys. There are limited examples of when you can, and PvMP is one of those cases where you can play all of your time in the game as an orc or whatever. Uh, session play is, is a really cool feature of the game that's, uh, I believe it's pretty unique to Lotro. And I believe it's one of the keys to the, the secret sauce of Lotro. And we'll talk about what session play is here in a minute. Deeding is something you may hear people talk about that they're doing. It's basically go kill 100 orcs in this area and you unlock this particular thing for your character or you get this reward. 
uh, crafting your craft guilds, you can make stuff. You can make weapons. You can make armor. You can make uh, housing decorations. You can make all kinds of things with stuff that you acquire in the game. Finally, roving threats are a fairly new piece of content. They're these big, big, bad, uh, bad guys who roam certain lower level areas and you either have to be way over, over their level or you need to have a bunch of friends with you to take them down, but you get rewards for them. So roving threats can be awesome. I believe my friend Eldaleth, uh, one of the other Lotro streamers and a moderator of the Signum U channel here, um, actually spend some time tracking those bad guys down and, and knocking them over because it's fun. So let's go into a little bit more detail about some of these. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about other people you're going to run across that aren't other players. NPCs, non-player characters. You'll find some that are friendly to you. You'll find some that are unfriendly to you. You'll find some that are going to attack you on site. So there's a reputation system in place that will determine some folks will be unfriendly to you at first, and then eventually they'll, they'll like you and you'll do stuff for you. Um... <clears throat> You'll find folks who are called quest givers. They're the ones who will send you on your adventures, telling you what to do, and then come back to them many times if you're Elrond. Some folks can be a friendly uh, NPC and also be a quest giver. Some of these can be multiple, you know, multiple of these options. Uh, there are vendors and barterers. These are characters that you can sell things to. Let's say... You got, um, you got some piece of junk off of a bad guy you killed. Well, you need to get it out of your bag, so you sell it to a vendor and get some silver for it, get some coin. Uh, some of them won't accept, uh, they, they won't accept things to give you money. They will trade you something like, oh, I'm trading this, um, this medallion I got to get this piece of armor that I want that they have in their, in their inventory. Uh, vault keepers are your bankers. Uh, they keep your stuff. Uh, vault keepers can access your personal bank, your personal vault, your shared storage, which is shared between all of your characters on that server, uh, your wardrobe, um, and those three. They can also now uh, buy things as a vendor, too. They didn't used to be able to do that, but they can now. Um, <clears throat> you'll find auctioneers. There is something called an auction house where you can sell certain unbound items to other players in the game to get silver or gold for it. Uh, some servers have better auction houses than others. And you'll find an auctioneer to be able to help you uh, buy and sell stuff. Uh, you'll find uh, characters called provisioners or suppliers. These are mainly related to crafters for the most part. The suppliers more more than provisioners. This is where you can buy things like you need to buy some food or you need to sell your junk or in some cases your gear, we mentioned your gear, your gear will wear out over time um, and therefore you need to repair it. Provisioners and suppliers can do both. Bankers can buy stuff from you but they can't repair your stuff. It's, uh... You'll also find crafting specific NPCs. Um, these are ones that will help train you in uh, various things and sell you various things for your crafting if you do that. And there's also unnamed towns full of various kinds all over the place, you know, because that makes it feel lived in, right? Sell you ingredients for your crafts. Uh, crafts. I did say the right word. <clears throat> so we mentioned quests. Here are our quest types. Um... Many quests in the game, the majority of the quests in the game are solo quests. You can do them in a group, but you don't have to. Um, there's something called a small fellowship quest. That is, if you're doing the quest and it's the same level, like you're level 20 and you're doing a small fellowship quest at level 20, you're probably going to want to bring a couple of friends with you. Small fellowships are three players maximum. Then there are fellowship quests which are six players maximum. And there's raids, which are generally 12 to 24. <laughs> I know, I'm actually blazing through these slides pretty good. Um, you may also see class quests. The only people who are that class, like champion, only champions can do that quest. Or only rune keepers can do that quest. Uh, crafting has its own separate set of quests. 
Uh, and they're basically things that will help you direct you on, okay, you need to create this higher level item to prove your proficiency kind of thing, or go do this and we'll give you this kind of reputation. Speaking of reputation, there are reputation quests as well. Uh, there's quests like, okay, go get me 10 of these tokens from these tomb robbers up in Evendim, and then I'll give you this amount of reputation with my group. There are festival quests. Right now, the spring festival is on, which means there are certain quests that you can do that are only available during certain times of the year. There's cat quests as well, apparently. And, and the quest is to get the cat to stop meowing in the background. So festivals are seasonal events. Um, there are several of them. If you ever want to know what festivals might be going on, there's things like the spring festival, the summer festival. Um, the anniversary is a festival. It's an out-of-game event. Well, no, let me rephrase it. It's an in-game event about an out-of-game anniversary. It's the anniversary of the game, which actually is April 24th every year. So the anniversary is a different festival, but it ties into the history of the game. It's really cool. Um, but we have a lot of festivals, um, and they generally kind of merge with in-theme, in-lore events. Like Mid-Leith is an event. We know there's a Yule event in, in the Shire. Come here, you dumb cat. Um... But they kind of also mirror real life holidays. Like there's the Yule event is basically like your Christmas, your Hanukkah, your Kwanzaa era. <clears throat> and then the Harvest Math Festival is basically Halloween. Come on, it's Halloween. Uh, and they do some spooky stuff and I love it. The Kitty Festival. <laughs> Kitty Festival. Um, so right now the Spring Festival is on and there are various events that you can do for all of the festivals. Like, okay, festival's on, therefore you can go race, do this horse race over here, or do this thing over there. But some of them have specific content for just that particular event. Like the Harvest Math Festival is generally around Halloween time in October and early November. And it's got spooky stuff in it. Um, the Yule Festival is Christmassy themed, but it's more of a a Victorian commercial Christmas, a more of a secular thing. They do try to keep there. There's a little bit of not breaking the fourth wall, but a little less serious, hardcore focus on the lore during festivals than outside the festivals. Right. It's a, you know, a little bit of a relaxing time. You meow. You picked up toe beans. All right. Another thing uh, we mentioned is a session play uh, quest, and those are during certain specific events during the epic quest. And we'll talk about session play because it's really cool. Uh, another kind of quest is a task quest, and those don't really make you travel anywhere. Those are basically there are certain items that you'll get that will drop. That's another term I should have put on my glossary that will drop from bad guys from monsters also known as mobs by the way and those items can be turned into certain npcs or what are called task boards to help gain reputation with various areas but they're but they are technically quests you just don't go anywhere you already have what you need to complete them in your bags hopefully um the folks on the pvmp side of things uh there are monster play quests they are very similar to the um pve the the basic side quests that we have because the main point of pvp is to fight the other players but when there aren't that many other players around people will you know do some things to help you know get their pvp ranks up all right also there are miscellaneous kinds of quests there's uh, a quest that a lot of players and a lot of mmos hate escort quests and it's generally for a couple of reasons number one the person or thing you're escorting walks really slowly. Which is Sarah Oakhart. That's why I mention her. She will be your least favorite escort quest in all of MMO gaming. The other one, uh, one of the other two reasons, or other three reasons why you may hate escort quests is the person you're escorting runs too fast. So you're struggling to keep up. The final one is that they, remember the term aggro, they 
basically aggro all of the mobs and you're fighting to keep them alive because most escort quests require you to keep that person alive until they're done doing whatever. <clears throat> all right. Some quests are timed, which means when you see that quest in your quest log off to the side, you will see a number counting down and you need to complete the objective before that number runs out. Some quests that once you like says, take this thing to this person across, you know, from one side of Brie to the other, you run there. Some quests will be like, you get close to the person you're supposed to get to and the quest automatically ends. Some of them require you to actually click on that person to finish the quest. So you got to keep an eye on that. Uh, instance quests, uh, you know what? We mentioned those. There are some quests that are in instances. We mentioned those earlier. And then there's some quests that require you to carry something from point A to point B. Again, a lot of those are also timed, but they're, they won't, you won't see the timer in the corner. What you'll see is a bar below your window here. You're, you're at the lower end of your window. It's a blue bar. Some carry quests will immediately start, you know, winding down. You see the blue bar and suddenly it's going away. Some of them, you could carry that item forever and nobody cares. But keep an eye on that. Some of them do count as a timer. So those are the kinds of quests you can run across in the game. All right. How do you, how do you find a quest, right? So a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away in a game called Diablo, a gentleman by the name of Mr. David Brevik, who has since become a friend, invented something called... Back when he worked on World of Warcraft, I, I think. But it also involved Diablo. Um, a question mark. I'm sorry. An exclamation point over a character's head. And the state of that question mark would tell you whether... Or the exclamation... Like, if they had something for you, it would be an exclamation point. If you were ready to turn it in, it was a question mark. In Lotro, that notion of an indicator over the character's head is a quest ring. It looks like the one ring. So it'll have a one ring icon over the head and will show up in the mini map in the corner with a little ring icon. The color of the icon matters. If it's gray, the, the quest is trivial to you, which means it's like nine or more levels below you. By default, trivial quests do not appear on the mini map. You actually can turn them on so you can see them. Let's say you want to go back and be a completionist. That's how you find the trivial quests if you're not next to the to the. So they're they're deliberately meant to be like harder to harder to see unless you're actually looking for them. Um, <clears throat> if it's blue, it'll be blue and it will have like a, a feather, like somebody's writing something, like a, a quill. Um, that means the quest's in progress. You, you've started a quest with this person. Some of these NPCs may have some additional dialogue. There's a quest line we'll talk about next week uh, called Bingo Boffin where you want to click on those NPCs when they have the blue uh, quest ring over their heads because they tell you cool stuff. So it'll also remind you of where you are in the quest. Like, okay, go talk to this person. <clears throat> if it's just a plain gold ring, that means there's a quest to you. It's a regular quest. Uh, either, you know, it's between eight levels below or six levels above you, that's a quest you can pick up, right? You right-click on the NPC, and it begins the, the quest uh, text. If it's gold with glowing letters, that's an epic quest. So it looks like the one ring having been tossed into Frodo's uh, fire. Do you determine, yes, it is the one ring because the text is on it. Finally, if it's fiery gold, that quest is ready to be turned in and get all the good stuff. So that's quest rings. That's how you can tell how to find quests and where you are in the quest. All right. <clears throat> we talked a bit about currencies, and these are the main kind of currencies that you have in the game. There's in-game gold, also referred to as coin. You get coin for something. That thing came out of D&D. <clears throat> You earn in-game gold by looting mobs, bad guys, selling items to a vendor, cat hair, Ugh. can I sell cat hair to a vendor, or selling items on the auction house. You cannot transfer in-game gold to real-life gold. There is actually no mechanic 
Um, and I don't think they'll ever want to have a mechanic where you can convert something in-game to real-life money. Therein lies the way to madness. <clears throat> Tom, Tomas, hold on to that question. We're going to answer that here in, in a couple of slides. There's barter currency. These are tokens that you acquire um, by killing things, by completing quests or whatever that you can... They, they drop from mobs. Rewards for quests are instances. Playing through festival content... Um, Festival tokens are a big thing where you can then barter with the vendors uh, to get stuff. If you have purchased something called a premium wallet, which I highly recommend, uh, even as a free-to-play player, once you get enough Lotro points, buy that thing because, oh my god, it's so useful. Um, because it takes all this barter currency and moves it out of your main bags and puts it in this separate wallet and then you don't have to worry about it. Trade to specific vendors for gear, housing items, cosmetics, consumables, and sometimes even mounts. Uh, as I say, some bartering requires certain levels of reputation with a faction or having completed certain kinds of content. For example, if you want to buy crafting recipes from the vendors in the, um, in the Grey Mountains, once you get to that content, you have to be the highest level of reputation with that local faction to be able to buy those. Which I really hate. Most bargaining currency is bound to account and cannot be traded to other players. However, low-level reputation tokens can be sold. I have bought stacks off at the auction house, and I've thanked those players immeasurably. Uh, you may also see people talk about Lotro points. They used to be called Turbine points back in the day when the company was still Turbine, um, which thankfully uh, has gone the way of the Dodo because the acronym uh, TP is far more charged right now than the current acronym of LP. You can earn Lotro points in-game very frequently, very easily, and this is how folks like Big Ed Mustafa manages his uh, addiction to Lotro without spending any real money, because you can buy many things in the game just by playing the game and grinding up Lotro points. Pastille, thank you for being here. Um, you definitely check out the rest of the VOD. There is going to be a lot more because I have a lot more slides. So uh, feel free to check it out later if you want to catch up uh, and be ready for next week or whenever I do the next class. <clears throat> and that's actually what you can... One of the cool things about Lotro Points is they are an account-wide currency, which means you... You grind them on one server, and you can spend them on another server if you want to. <clears throat> you can also buy Lotro points with real-life money. Um, and you do that uh, either in the in-game store or the out-of-game market site. We'll talk about those two sites here in a little bit. And also, if you're a VIP player, you're paying the 15 bucks a month or whatever for the VIP subscription, or you're a lifer like me, you get a monthly stipend of 500 Lotro points, which which we, you would think that I would have like a million Lotro points sitting around. No, I spend them. I spend them like crazy. Uh, another currency is called Mithril Coin. That is purchased with Lotro points in the in-game store. And they are then used to buy certain things in the game, such as, I don't feel like going from one end of Forachel to the other, um, so I'll spend a Mithril coin to do that travel without having to, you know, ride the long way. I did that the other night. Um, <clears throat> mithril coins are the closest that you're going to see to real money translating into something in-game, uh, in that case, because, again, the only way to get Mithril coin is to buy Lotro, or get Lotro points, and the quickest way to buy Lotro points is real money. All right, Destiny points. A lot of people forget about Destiny points, but every account accrues 200 Destiny points per level by all accounts, but you can only spend them uh, if you're a VIP. And there's certain things that you can do with Destiny points that people always forget because hardly anybody remembers about them, but you can access Destiny points through the... Um, to the uh, UI and if you want to see what most of them are like short-term boosts to certain things like you get more attack like you're slightly more powerful or whatever the, the only good use of destiny points in my opinion is you can get yourself a five-time supply of XP 
But those are pretty much the only ones that you get the XP and they don't go away. They don't have a timer. You just get them. So that's really cool. <clears throat> but most people forget they even exist. I think I have 60 some odd thousand destiny points. Because I never spend them. I always forget to spend them. All right. Next. <clears throat> we mentioned the Lotro store and the Lotro market. These are two separate things. So the Lotro store is the in-game store, also known as the cash shop. Ironically, you don't... Well, you can use real cash for it. Items are purchased with Lotro points that you earn in-game. And Lotro points themselves can be purchased with real money via credit card or PayPal. Items purchased are bound to account. So if you want to... If you think that you're going to spend like some real-life money, get some stuff, and then uh, sell them to other players, nah, can't happen. So you can only buy stuff your own account. Uh, and if you're a streamer like me, don't be like me in this case because I actually don't pay attention to this rule. Uh, well, I don't do the foolish reason for this. Streamers are advised to enable the external browser option to avoid revealing their credit card detail. Um, it's also recommended that streamers avoid using the internal in-game uh, shop simply because it will show your account name in the window. <clears throat> it didn't used to do that. But everybody knows me as Druid's Fire, so that was pretty much people were going to guess that anyway, so I didn't feel the need. But the important thing, and this actually happened to Professor Corey, not, fortunately nothing bad happened because I caught it and fixed it, but because you can buy stuff, you can buy Lotro points with your credit card in the in-game store, and if you're a streaming that... And people can see your window. They'll see part of your credit card. They'll know what type of credit card it is. Uh, and if you need to update your credit card, for the love of God, don't do that on the stream. If it's critical, enable the external browser and then open the brow you know, open the store in that browser. Do your business over there. Make sure it's not visible to your stream, because even. If all you're doing is using an existing, an existing saved credit card to make a purchase of Lotro points or to update your VIP subscription, they'll see what kind of credit card it is in the last four digits. I actually wound up having to edit uh, a video on demand on the Lotro channel because those are saved automatically um, because they're, they're not a Twitch partner per se, but they are kind of. Um, because Corey's VIP had lapsed during a Grifflet or Grifflet stream or a marathon during a Grifflet stream. And he went into the store to re-up his, his thing and his credit card failed because they were having a problem with that kind of credit card at the time. And you notice how I'm not saying what kind of credit card it was. So I had to go back and edit that tiny minute or so out of the video because, yeah, we're not getting his credit card compromised. The Lotro Market is the out-of-game store website. Um... It is run by a company called Digital River, uh, and the in-game store is run by a company called Zola. That's X-S-O-L-L-A. So, uh, the Lotro Market is store.standingstonegames.com, and that's where you can buy expansions. Uh, all items are purchased with real money. You can do that with credit card or, like, PayPal, you know, various other forms of legal tender. You can also choose what currency you're spending your monies with. Like my default is um, the American, like there's a flag in the upper right corner where you can choose like um, United States, the UK, France, or Germany. Bearing in mind that um, some things will be uh, like in the EU will be hit with VAT. Taxes are completely out of Standing Stone's hands. They will adhere to the tax laws of that region. Just saying. <clears throat> Typically only offers expansions, quest packs, game time codes, skirmish packs. All sales will give you a code that you can give away. Uh, this is how actually a lot of streamers wind up give, having expansions to give away. As we buy the codes and then give, you know, do a giveaway in our channels. Um, so you can gift them to others if you want to. Um, one of the things about it is sometimes there are sales for both in-game store. There's always a, a sale every week in the in-game store. 
And then the market, the real money one, has weekly, you know, the in-game one will have a weekly sale. The the money one will have, you know, generally around the holidays, they'll have some kind of special sale or something like, you know, half off this particular, you know, these expansions or whatever. One of the things about the Lotro market, if you buy an expansion there, you may get more stuff. For example, let's use the game's most current expansion, Minus Morgul. If you buy that on the cash store, the actual, you know, Lotro Market website, you will get things like the Stout Axe Race included. You can buy, like, three different versions of that expansion that get you more stuff. Uh, when you buy it in the in-game store for Lotro points, you're not spending extra money, not necessarily spending extra money on the game. So you don't get all the goodies. You just get the quests, the content. You don't get the extra races. You don't get the cosmetics. You don't get the special titles. You just get to play the quests. And some people are cool with that. Because guess what? I ground up the Lotro points. I didn't have to pay for it. I didn't worry about it. So, and that's how, again, folks like Big Ed Mustafa, that's how they get their expansions is they grind up the Lotro points and buy them in the in-game store so they don't have to spend a real dime or cent on the game on the other hand i'm what gamers would refer to as a whale i throw lots of money at standing stone because i like the product <clears throat> so i'm not just the president i'm i'm a user now i don't work for standing stone so that's how you can throw your life savings at standing stone and here's uh, another caution there are third-party sites that will sell expansions or certain pieces of content. I would discourage you from using them. And there's a couple of reasons why you'd want to be cautious. To just to be simply cautious is these people don't work for Standing Stone. Many of these game code sites may have gotten their codes dishonestly shall we say? Um, or they did it with, and dishonestly, like they may have created something called a key generator, which generates a key for that content, which may actually work and may not. You never know. You know, buyer beware, caveat emptor. Also, they may use your stuff and steal your credit card information or your PayPal information or whatever. So you want to be very careful. Because sadly, there are, are enough dishonest people out there trying to make a buck, trying to scam people, willing to steal your money, steal your identity. So third-party sites, you always want to question. I mean, there are some reputable ones out there like Steam uh, by the Valve Corporation. Steam is a legitimate supplier of certain content. Like you can download Lotro from Steam. That's perfectly fine. That's not a problem. Occasionally, Steam will let you buy a couple of things from Lotro, for Lotro. Like, um, there was a starter pack they had for, like, 10 bucks or something. They got you an armor set or whatnot. That was fine. Um, but other than Steam, there is no other a legitimate authorized seller of Lotro content. And the final reason why you wouldn't want to patronize any of those other people, and I would hesitate about Steam, except, you know, if it's only available on Steam, then go there, is Lotro, Standing Stone sees... This is how much money that they see out of that. None of it. Okay? Again, with the third-party sellers other than Steam, if they're getting their stuff dishonestly, here's how they do it. They steal somebody's credit card. They go buy some... They might even buy legitimate keys from Standing Stone at market value, or whatever the market value is. Hey, it's a stolen credit card. They don't care. And then they'll do a chargeback on it. So they will then, uh, or if it's a legitimate credit card from them, like, it, you know, that person's actual real credit card, they'll do a chargeback on that card. Standing Stone not only has to give the money back, Standing Stone also gets hit with a fee by their financial institution for the chargeback. So that's why you don't want to just do a chargeback whenever a company makes you mad or something, um, because you're, you're basically penalizing the company. And bad people like to do that, so be a good person and don't do that. <clears throat> All right. 
So enough about the money side of things. Let's talk about the map. We talked about the we showed you the map previously on a previous show. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the map. Um, some games have something on them called Fog of War, which will hide the map until you explore that area. Lotro used to have that. It went away very early on. And some people was like, I want the Fog of War back. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where you personally have gone. You can see the entire map of Middle Earth. Um, there are two kinds of maps. There's the older ones that look like parchment. And there's a newer one that looks like Google Satellite View, right? Uh, there are compass icons in various places, like you hover over the name of, like, Gondor, and it will pull up a very faint compass rose. You click on that compass, it then will zoom into that particular map. Uh, most places that say 2 and they have a name like 2 Agarnath, well, you click on that, it will be one of those little compasses that will pull up the Agarnath map, for example. Um... It uses color-coded areas and questering icons to, like, if you have five quests in your quest tracker, those five quests can show up on your map. You can disable that if that annoys you, but it's very handy to try and find out where you need to go to do something. Um, you can edit which colors those quests show up on on the map. Yeah, actually, Dragon Rider brings up a good point about Fog of War. Um, there is... Basically, anytime there is a maze, like the Spring Festival and the Harvest Math Festival have mazes, like there's a corn maze, or actually, it's, I think it's a wheat, it's a wheat maze. Um, because those are mazes, those are not intended for you to see on the minimap, they will hide those with what's called, they'll, they'll just blur the image so you can't see where you're going. It's by design. <clears throat> Um, if you hover your cursor point over a quest in the quest tracker, it's color-coded area, and our quest ring will pulse on the map. Uh, you can, uh, set up map notes to remind yourself of things. I've never used map notes, I must say. But it allows you to, uh, well, filter map notes, uh, at the top allows you to deselect things that are like, oh my god, I don't want to see all of these things on my map. So... Um, show map menu at the top allows for switching to different maps based on the zone name. Let's say you're currently in, I'm currently hanging out at, at the outside outskirts of Bree. But let's say I want to go look at the map of Mordor. Well, I pull up the map uh, and I pull down show map, the drop down menu, and I choose Mordor and choose whatever. <coughs> Take care, Jesse. And finally, you can go to the Stable Master menu, which will let you see where all the Stable Masters are that you have discovered, and that you can unlock. You can also unlock and travel to the ones you've never been to before with Mithril Coin. And let me actually show that to you. I have got the game up. I've been sitting here, and my character, uh, you've probably been hearing crickets and stuff in the background. That is this game. Uh, this is my hunter on the Crick Hollow server, hanging out. We're actually looking down upon Bree. But let's go take a look at the map. So this is one of the older parchment style maps that we were talking about. And um, my quest guide isn't appearing here because I don't have any quests in Bree. So we should probably go someplace where I do have quests. So you can see what I'm talking about. And we did go over this. Um, let's see, where do I have quests? Do, 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 do. Let's actually go to, let's pull this quest up. Nah, I need some place where I have a lot of quests. Iron Fall, no, Iron Mithrin, no. I need a place that I've got a lot of quests that I can show off. Here we go, Dora Marth. put these quests on my quest tracker. Let's turn that one off. I need another space. There we go. So we're going to go to Mordor because, you know, why not? Uh, we're going to do this real quick because I don't want to spend too much time on the map when we've already done that crunch. It's like, why aren't you porting to the, you know what? I can actually. I have a swift travel there. Haha. 
I forgot I had unlocked uh, all the allegiance quests on this character. We'll talk about allegiance quests here in a minute. We'll wind up in Gondor for a second. We're going to go to Mordor. The scary of Mordor. Loud music. Yep. And we're going to go to the ruins of Dingarth because it's in Doramarth. So this is the using a stable master. This is how you can get around. <clears throat> All right, so we are in Dora Marth, which this is in Mordor. You can uh, again turn off your quest guide with this little check mark, which you can't see because hey, I'm in the way. Uh, let me see if I can turn myself my face off. Just a few moments. So this is your quest tracker as displayed in the map. And you can move it around. Just click and drag. And as you see, two Lingris has our little compass rose that you can then click on. It will show you the Lingris map, the Udun map. This is also one of the ways you can kind of guess where they might be going next is the two thing doesn't show the compass, but there's the, there's the trail there. So I have this quest that says I need to go to all these places. What's Mordor to besiege, you say? Oh, well, we're not going to tell you about that. <clears throat> so we have these quests that I can do. So if I hover over one of these quests, the associated content starts blinking. So it's like, oh, hey, that's what that is. And so if it's these big colored areas, you can then... And I'm talking with my hands and you can't even see it. It's really funny. So if you see these big blinking areas, that'll help you find where you need to go. Um, you can also change the color of these quests. So that was an orange one. I can change it to be blue because I like everything in blue. But you can only do one color per thing. So, well, I lied. You can make all of them blue. I'm going to make all of them blue. Like I did this to Niagara Falls once. This can be confusing. So that's the whole point of having different quest colors is so that they don't look the same. And I think by default they just go down the row here. All right? Nice rainbow effect. And then you can uncheck them and it will take that particular group out of there. It is a little bit harder to find um, the quest destination when it's just a quest ring. So if you notice, the Legacy of Bardur has all these little spots that blink, but the search for Sapakar, it, it's harder to find because it's just a single quest ring. But you see, the quest ring is pulsing at Baradur. So sometimes, if there's just that one singular location to go to, it'll be harder to find because it's just the quest ring. So I'm actually going to port my character back to Bree because I don't want to listen to the um, to the Mordor music while we're doing this. <clears throat> we'll also discuss our stable master map here in just a second. So let's get back. Uh, let's go back to Bree. Where is Bree? <sighs> Guide to Bree. It's like I had so many destinations. I was like, where the heck am I going? Yep, there's Legolas and Gimli in the corner. Let me turn my face back on. Boop. Boop. All right. Ah! More people. All right. We're just going to go hang out here on the outskirts of Bree. We're also going to go back into the map. So as I mentioned, filter map notes is basically you can choose what items will show up. Like your auctioneer, your barber. There are barbers, like, let's say you created your character and you didn't like what they look like. You can change that. Um, bard is a specific kind of character. A campsite is useful for characters like myself. I'm playing a hunter. Uh, but it wouldn't be so useful for, say, a champion, right? Um, and so you can tell it to either take all of these away. Calgon, take me away! Or you can have them display all of them. Or you can select any of these that you so desire and it will filter what icons show up on the map <coughs> here's 
can also hover over the icons on the map and they will tell you what it is. Like, here's the reflecting pool. What's a reflecting pool, you might ask? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Show map. So again, it will show you the map based on the zones of the four major areas of the game. Eriador, Rovanian, Gondor, and Mordor. Um, so it gives you a lot of places that you can look at the map and see what they look like. Um, and they have some that are, like, let's show all of Gondor. Foom. And this is one of the satellite version, you know, Google satellite kind of map. These are fairly new. Um, they've only done maps of this for major areas. Like, Rohan doesn't have one yet. I was a little bit surprised they didn't put one in for Rohan um, when they created, uh, or when they put Riders of Rohan on the legendary server, but it just didn't happen. So it is what it is. You can also right-click on a lot of these, and it will zoom out until this is the, the main map that you zoom out. But some maps, if you right-click on them, it'll just take you entirely out of the map. So... Let's go back into the main one. And the final map is part of the collections system, which we'll talk about the collection systems uh, when we get into like systems in general, but it's also part of the map. Uh, and this will show you which stable masters you have seen already, which are the ones that got the little dot in them. The ones you haven't discovered yet have the little open dot. And some of them mean something else. Like you see the symbol here for Holtvis has a star around the icon and that means it's like a major hub those are kind of cool so if you click on one let's click on Holtvis it tells me that it's undiscovered location so I haven't been there yet I haven't unlocked it yet I can still travel there with mithril coin it's always five for a place you've never been to before two mithril coins for a place you have been to before or unlocked. Uh, it will also show you the map of where that area is, which is right here. It's Holtvis. It will also tell you, and this is the really cool thing, it will also tell you where you can go from there. And it will also mention places maybe twice, like Blomgard, Bjornihus, they're both mentioned twice. It's like, what's Swift Travel? Um, Swift Travel is basically... You you mount the horse, you start up a little ways, and then you van it, you fade out, and then appear close to and ride, finish the ride. Basically, you're not doing the landscape ride to that area. Some swift travel options are locked. Actually, uh, free to play accounts don't have swift travel options unless they spend the mithril coin. Um, some of them you can only. Uh, unlock if you have done enough quests in that area, you become an acquaintance with the local faction, like Suri Kyla up here in Forachel. Why this character hasn't unlocked it yet, I have no idea. <laughs> I haven't done the questing up there, I guess. The only way my character can get there is I have to discover it, and then I have to do enough questing with the Lossoth to become an acquaintance of them. I have to be, you know... I have to do enough quests just to, to not be friends, because that's a special title. Um, and we'll talk about reputations in a bit. So, some of them require you to have completed a certain quest in the epic storyline. Some of them require you to have be a certain level. Like, um, you can swift travel from Oscar Ruth here in the, tr in the Lone Lands to Rivendell. But you can't swift travel from uh, Bree, so South Bree in this case, to Rivendell unless you're level 40. So there's some restrictions on it. Mithril coin overrides all restrictions. It just is. Basically, if you're throwing money at the game, they let you do a lot more. And that's what that is. So we're just going to hang out here. Um, and that's the map. Let's go back to our slides. Boop. And let's move on. We've got another slide. Foom. Quest difficulty. Um, this is, you probably saw that in my quest uh, tracker. Uh, it's like, why are they all gray? They were all low level quests. Um, quests have a set recommended level. 
and their listing in the quest log that uh, I showed you there for a moment will change based uh, change color based on what your level is. Many things in the game will change color based on what your level is in comparison to that thing. So if it's gray, that quest is nine or more levels below you, flagged as a trivial quest. We mentioned those before. If you complete that quest, you'll still get the rewards, but you won't get any experience points for it. It won't help you level up. Green are six to eight levels below, as you can see on the chart. Scion or turquoise. Some people refer to that as teal. That is not teal. Um, and those are three to five levels. Blue is one to two levels. White is same level as you. You may refer may hear people refer to that as being on level. It's on the same level as you are. Uh, yellow is one or two levels above you. Orange is three to four. Red is five to seven. Purple is eight plus. And you can't acquire, in most cases, you can't acquire quests that are more than eight levels above you. There are certain exceptions for like crafting quests. I remember doing uh, level 30 crafting quests for cooking in the Shire back in the day. And I know I wasn't level 30 at the time because those quests were purple in my log. And as you mentioned, quests also have a group size assigned to them. Solo. Some can some quests, as I mentioned earlier, is you can take friends with you on a solo quest. In some cases, there are a number of solo only quests in the game where it can only be you running that content. No friends. You gotta do it by yourself. A lot of them are a part of the epic story and don't really require friends with you, so you don't need people to go with you. Then there's small fellowship quests. Again, three people, up to three. You can run them with fewer people if you want. They are harder unless you're, a, again, depending on where that quest lies in the color scheme of things. Um, <clears throat> fellowship is up to six people or raid is 12 to 24. Uh, content is scaled based on the group size, assuming all players are on level. Again, if you're playing a three-person quest and you're all on on level so the quest is white to you in the quest tracker you're going to want to take three people with you well you're going to want to take two people with you and be a party of three because otherwise the bad guys are probably going to ruffle stomp you and i speak from experience there is um a fellowship quest that i did with uh former lotro community manager sapiens and his wife anita and it was a fellowship quest, a six-person quest, and there was only three of us, and she was the only one who was above the level. The other two of us were below the level, and we got stomped. It was actually quite funny. <clears throat> However, it is possible uh, if you're really uh, well-geared or maybe a level or two above a, a, fellowship, a, a small fellowship quest that you could might take it, but it might be really tough. So anything that's white or lower on that list, white, yellow, orange, red, the harder it's going to be for you to do that by yourself. Take friends if you want to. Besides, it's, it's fun. <coughs> no, I'm not sick. Mob difficulty also goes on a similar scale, as you see. Um, Lotro has something actually a little bit unusual. Most games, most MMOs don't do this. As, uh, as you can see, mobs have colored nameplates indicating their difficulty relative to you, to your level. Uh, <clears throat> Lotro, unlike many other games, once the mob is gray to you, and notice I spell gray the way Tolkien does, that's Tolkien's fault, uh, they won't attack you, uh, even if you're standing right on top of them, unless you attack them first. The only exception to that is when you're running instances of any kind, like instance content, session play, anything where you're on a quest in a separate instance area, they'll attack you no matter what. It doesn't matter how high level you are compared to them. They, they will attack because that's part of the quest that they're set up that way. Uh, and again, the harder they are, the further down the line you get. Um, 
If they are gray, you will not uh, get any XP for them, even if they're part of a quest. Very, very minute XP. Maybe. I, I rarely have, like, maybe one or two XP or something silly like that. Um, <clears throat> and if they're purple, uh, it's also very possible if a mob is purple to you, when you attack it, they will take zero damage from you. And then it'll turn around and... Pfft, So you get, and if you manage to kill them somehow, like you're, you're partnered up with somebody and they kill, help you kill them, you don't get any XP for it. Uh, but if it's a quest, like we're helping you kill a quest mob, like oh, this thing's going to drop something for your quest, you'll still get it. Uh, mobs also have different designs on their vitals. You, you notice we showed the vitals of my character. She had the little circle around her face. Well, mobs also have those little circles, and they have different designs based on how hard they are. And for more details about that, I'm going to drop this link in chat, because um, it will define all the various uh, difficulty indicators, because all that stuff is way more than a single slide, and it makes a lot of sense. So, difficulty indicators, and that will tell you how hard that uh, quest or that mob is supposed to be compared to you. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Landscape quest, yay! This is the the meat, the meat and potatoes of Lotro. What's potatoes, precious? This. All right. <clears throat> Two main kinds of landscape quests. There's the epic quest line. Um, Tomas, this answers your question from earlier. What what's? It's broken down into volumes, books, and chapters, just like the Tolkien books. Sometimes it can get a little confusing because they changed, they changed, they changed uh, numbering schemes over the years. Um, in Mordor through Minas Morgul, those two ex expansions, Mordor and Minas Morgul expansions, there's a special story uh, based on what happens after the end of the ring uh, called the Black Book of Mordor. You see it uh, abbreviated to BBOM. I finished the Black Book of Mordor last night on my official Lotro stream. It made me cry at one point. I cried on stream. And then late last night after the stream was over, and I also was only supposed to stream for three hours. I wound up streaming for six. Um, I wound up going onto the forums and sending a private message to Maid of Lions, the person who wrote that story. And I just spazzed, spazzed out about it. It was because it was so good. <clears throat> in the original launch of the game, the epic quest line could not be soloed. Like in the original Shadows of Angmar, level 1 to 50 content, there were certain bits of the epic quest line that required a fellowship, either three people or six. You couldn't do it on your own. And people complained because, like, I can't do the story, I can't play the game. So when the first expansion came out, Mines of Moria, they revamped, um, they revamped all that content so that they the quests still are fellowship quests, but they introduced a mechanic called Inspiration <clears throat> that will buff a solo player so that you can attack with a force of three or six players on on that same level. What's really cool is I've noticed the inspiration buff also applies to high level characters as well. So I, I took a like a level 150, 15 or something through like one of those old quests and she was doing, her stats looked amazing. <clears throat> are there black named mobs? No, Emmerborn, there are not. Purple is the highest they go. The cool thing about the epic or book quest line, it frequently includes those book characters like Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli. The Fellowship characters will appear. You'll talk to Elrond and Gandalf. Um, you'll, t you'll interact with Smeagol. Calm. It tells a story for those of us left to defend Middle-earth while the Fellowship is off doing their sneaky sneaky down to their end run down to Mordor. It fills in the gaps left by the Lord without breaking that lore. And that's one thing that's really special about Lotro is when they first sat down and said, hey, we're going to make this Middle Earth online, which is what it originally was, was called, 
they decided back then, and they've held mostly true to this base concept of they're going to not override the books. And anything they do to fill in the gaps left by the books will still feel the same. Um, there's like a quest uh, in the Shadows of Angmar, original uh, game content called... Um, it ends with a fellowship quest called the Tomb of Elendil, a level 40 quest. And it tells the story that isn't required for the reforging of Narsil into Anduril. But it adds a layer to that story, which is really good. Um, and because that quest is not part of the epic quest line, it's one of these side quests that you see below here. You can't use inspiration to do the Tomb of Elendil. You need friends or you need to be really high level compared to it. Uh, and so much talking to Elrond. Oh my god, you go back and forth to Elrond so many times. Side quests are the ones that fill in what's going on around in, you know, let's say you're in Breland, you're going to do quests of like, well, we know certain elements of the story, like what happened in Bree when the Fellowship left? Like when, when Strider and the Hobbits left, what happened in Bree? Well, we know some stuff. Well, they fill in the blanks. It's really cool. Yeah, the the Tomb of Elendil uh, Fellowship quest, you gotta be really over-leveled to take that one out. Ugh. Um, <clears throat> so, some of these stories are truly heroic in scale. They're not crucial to the Lord of the Rings narrative. So, you're not going to do a major facet of lore content inside questing. Unless it you know, I think the highest one is that Silithar quest that I was mentioning with the Tomb of Lendil, that quest line. So, it's basically filling in the blanks, letting you grind reputation uh, if you want to get certain things from the faction vendors, whatever. So, they're more for players to interact with game mechanics, um, and they're very optional. You don't have to do, you don't have to do them unless you feel like being a completionist. So, there's that. Next up, instances. We've talked about these a bit. Three to six person content separated from the rest of the landscape. Some have one or two called a duo. There's like a solo or duo. Some of that you can do either one person or two people. Once you get to three people, then things go weird. Um, they are accessed through an instance finder. Some of them won't show up in the instance finder until you actually find where they are in the game. There is an instance in Angmar called the Halls of Night. It doesn't show up in your instance finder until you actually go to where you go into that particular instance content. Uh, they do emphasize the use of teamwork and class mechanics. So if you are, say, a tank, we'll discuss the Holy Trinity here in a bit. If you are the person who draws that aggro from the bad guys, then you need one of those. Or you might need somebody to you know, heal everybody up. Or you need somebody who is going to be doing all the damage. Uh, many of these instances can be scaled to different levels. Like, let's say you're, you're level 130, but you want to do a certain instance at level 121 because you want to show it off to your stream without being too difficult. Like, I do that a lot because, <clears throat> while I sometimes find it very hilarious to, you know, have my stream audience be entertained by me dying ignominiously on camera. I also want to be able to get through the content so I can move on with the story. Rewards are commensurate with the level and number of players involved. The more players, uh, the higher, harder levels you do, the, the better stuff you're going to get for it. So I'm going to show you the instance finder here real quick. So switch over to the gameplay. There is a shortcut for the instance finder. And I always forget because they just changed. It's control J by default. This is what it looks like now. This didn't be what it used to look like before. <clears throat> and so you can search based on the name, and the name is the quest. You see a lot of these are grayed out. That means I'm not eligible to do them yet. This is also called the group finder. This is how you can find, as you see, other people here are saying, hey, I'm doing this particular instance. These are the levels I'll take with me. Uh, and this is the tier I want to do it. Now, the tier matters based on, because the higher the tier, the harder it is. And the better reward you're going to get if you complete it successfully. 
And you can also choose the size of the, the party going with you, 1 to 24. You can also choose what level that quest or how you're going to run that. However, a lot of things have a minimum quest level. Like you can't run certain things below their level. For example, one of the ones I did recently on a character. Where where the heck is it? One of the Minas Morgul ones uh, was this one. I can click on it. I can see it. If you notice, for grouping requests, it says minimum level 121, max 130, because that's the current max. Then you can also choose which classes you want to go with you. Like, let's say I'm a champion, so I don't want other champions because I we already got one, right? You can do that. <clears throat> Once you choose one that it, you're eligible for, that you set it up correctly, that you're within the right levels, by default, it will automatically fill in these at size one, tier one, and the level. Unless you're in a group, then it will it'll do whatever. And then I can do this in any of five tiers. This has five tiers of content. Um, and it automatically adjusts it to my level, 126. And then I can just click launch now and start that content right now. I'm not going to because my character has no gear and is going to die. <clears throat> And that's basically the instance finder in a nutshell. It's very handy. And you can also search by name. So Halls of Night appears on this character because I've been there. <clears throat> uh, the instance finder will also show you other content besides just... Um, it will also show you the epic battles that we mentioned before. The Defense of Rohan, the War of Gondor, and their various segments. Uh, it will show you... Other instances throughout the game that you can go to. As you can see, uh, this is a six-person instance. Some of them won't let you change the tier or the group size. They will let you change the level. So I could scale this down and still do this at level 40. If I wanted to. If my uh, keyboard wants me, to, wants me to put this in here. So I could still play this. But if I try to do it at like level 20, my launch button is grayed out because it requires you to be at least level 40. Again, you can run these with fewer numbers of people than are recommended. But if you're on level, it's not recommended. I'm just saying. <clears throat> Some of them do not scale. They won't let you change the scale. The the instance is set at a certain level, and that's the level you have. Those the bad guys are set to that level. <clears throat> and they have the same old rewards as they always had. So these are the other ones I was mentioning. Uh, the non-scaling instances, like you can go into Angmar and run the Rift of Nurs Ga Gashu. Which, for the longest time, it's a 12-man raid. 12-man, 12 12-person 12 raid. Uh, it only has three tiers. And it is always level 50. Because that used to be the level cap. And that's the way it is. However, I can request people of any level above 50 to join me if they want to. But the gear that we're going to get is based for level 50 characters. That doesn't change. I don't get really cool level 126 gear by doing that old content. Um, you can also find uh, skirmishes here. And also there are seasonal events. <coughs> seasonal instances that show up. There's one in summer, one at the Yule Festival, and they're fun, actually. Uh, and your skirmishers will be here once you've unlocked the skirmish tutorial and played through the skirmish tutorial at level 20. Well, it unlocks at level 20. You can complete the tutorial at any time, but you can't do skirmishes until you do the tutorial. So those are fun. So those are instances uh, for you. So I'm sorry, the instance finder for you. Boop. Let's go back to the spreadsheet of, I'm sorry, the uh, stuff of doom here. Next, oh man, I've got my, my num lock on. All right, skirmishes, as I mentioned. These are scaling instances. They can be run with any group size up to 12. A 12-person 12 
person uh, skirmish is called a scrade because it's a skirmish raid. Scrade. <clears throat> loot scales to group size and level versus level of players. Loot can be silver, coin, uh, barter currency, legendary item consumables, and reputation. There are three kinds. You probably saw them on the instance finder there a minute ago. Uh, they also, they not only have a main set of stories, like you got to do this, e this portion, you know, fight off these guys, defend from these guys. Sometimes they have random side encounters and there's deeds associated with completing all of them. You won't ever complete a single deed, uh, like a single, like defeat these 10 different bad guys in these side encounters. You're not going to get all 10 in the same. You have to do the skirmishes repeatedly to, to get them all done. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned, the tutorial for Skirmish is available at level 20, and we saw they're accessible in the uh, Instance Finder. Some of them, uh, starting with the first expansion, the Mines of Moria, require you to complete Skirmishes. So I personally recommend, once you get a character to level 20 or above, do the tutorial and get that out of the way so that when you get to that content level 50 plus in Moria, you're already ready to go. Uh, there are skirmish camps that you can find dotted all over the landscape. Um, let's go back to the game for just a second. I'll show you where the one in Bree is. They are denoted by this cluster of blue flags right here. And we're going to go ride around Bree because it's laggy in Bree. I'm going to show you my war steed while I'm at it. And the skirmish camp has various vendors that you can buy stuff with. Some stuff won't unlock for you or be available until you complete certain uh, things. Like you can't barter for gear in Heligrod unless you've been in Heligrod. Some stuff it's always available. You can get like cosmetic items to make your character look pretty. Um, you can get um, various pieces of gear. You can get certain uh, consumables like, you know, certain kinds of foods. Um, well, there's a lot of things you can do with the skirmish, and there's skirmish camps all over the landscape, like in generally near many major uh, town. Like Bree has one, Esteldine in the North Downs has one, um, Minas Tirith has one. And you see these flags? These flags uh, relate to skirmishes, so. So you'd want to talk to a skirmish captain to start the party, and then there's the trainer. One of the things you can do in skirmishes is you are given what's called a soldier to go with you. And that soldier can be customized based on what you want them to do. They can either, you know, be a person who's taking all the aggro from the bad guys. They can be a healer. They can be an archer. They can, like, shoot people from a distance. So you can also get crafting stuff here. You can get some armor sets. You can get some uh, certain kinds of legendary items. <clears throat> One of the unfortunate things is they haven't really updated skirmishes since they originally introduced. There's been some, but not much. Uh, and training your skirmish shoulder only goes so far. It's actually better to have friends with you if you need extra hands to help you out. I wish there was a skip tutorial button for skirms. Heck yeah. I wish there was. I, I wish there was a thing where... If you had already been through at least once on a specific server, it unlocked. I wouldn't mind having to do it like once per server. <clears throat> so you can buy all kinds of things here. And I'm going to move her away from these guys making all the noise. We're just going to go listen to the landscape here. Hang out with the Nika Breakers and the, the Boars. So that's a skirmish camp. All right. Back to the slides. All right. Raids, as I mentioned, they are supposed to be the toughest content in the game. Mainly 12-person instances, but you can take 24 with you. But the quests for raids are 12-person for the most part. As we mentioned with the instance finders, some can be scaled in level, some cannot. Multiple difficulty settings, tiers 1 through 5. Um, most raids will start off um, they release the tier sequentially, um, over time for the new ones. Um, and 
Tiers 4 and 5 are fairly new for a lot of the raids. And you get some really sweet stuff out of them. You know, special exclusive titles, housing items, cosmetics, uh, gear. Reward scale to the difficulty. Most have multiple bosses. There's actually one that has one single boss. Frequently known as Turtle. <clears throat> Most can be soloed by over-level players. Some cannot. <clears throat> Some of them have uh, mechanics involved where you need multiple people to help you out to complete the task. Um, and that's just the way they're made and there's nothing... Um, there have been some requests to make some of them soloable uh, as raids get older and older, but uh, that takes time and resources that Sanding Stone hasn't got. Uh, uh, many, again, can be accessed by traveling to the instance or through the raid f or for the instance finder. The raid finder link is as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they, some of them often provide a coda to a zone story but aren't required to complete it. Some of them, uh, with fairly recent content, there was some that was the actual end point, not of the epic story, but of the side quest part of the story, the zone story, ended in the raid. But there was no way for people who wanted to see what the how the story ended could play that unless they played through the raid. So in a couple of cases, Standing Stone made... Um, made not shortcuts through the raid necessarily, but they made some of the content so it was like a story mode so you could play through most of it or get a, a summary of what happened so you don't miss out on that. It's really cool. <clears throat> and raiding um, is very competitive at the higher end. Um, very competitive for the top kinships to complete it first for bragging rights and for special titles. Back in the day... Until bad people ruined it, as most things get taken away because bad people ruined it. it. Used to be back in the day, the first kinship, the first group to finish a specific raid at the highest tier got a special title that only those 12 people could have on the entire server. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what happened at one point was one kinship transferred their characters to another server... After they lost out on the title on their own server. Completed the raid on that other server which hadn't completed it yet. Took the titles and then transferred their characters back. Which meant the characters on the server. The second server. Nobody on that server has the title. And that caused a lot of problems. And while well, nobody that I'm aware of really got in trouble for it because technically it wasn't against the rules. It caused a lot of ups. It caused a lot of drama. And I, I don't want to say drama like, oh, it's just drama. You can just ignore it. It was really, first of all, it was a rude thing to do. Uh, secondly, it caused all this anger that really was unnecessary. So in response, Standing Stone has now made it so that once a raid opens up for those titles, they're available for anybody who completes that content up to, like, the first month after it's released. So anybody can have that title uh, up to that point, and then, you know, it's done. <clears throat> uh, yes, I am supposed to be showing a slide. Thank you. I hit the wrong button. Thank you, Bookworm. Love you. So, raids are the toughest content in the game. 12-person instances... Some can be scaled in level, some can't. Multiple difficulty settings. Uh, they do scale to difficulty uh, and reward scale, which is really cool. Some stuff you can't get on lower, uh, in lower scaled versions. You need to do the higher stuff. I am personally of the opinion, uh, if you want to earn raid rewards, do the raid. I am not a fan of putting raid quality rewards out available to regular vendors. <clears throat> some of the raid rewards, let's say you go through a raid and you get a piece of loot, a piece of gear, but you can't use it. There's a mechanic in place that allows you to trade that gear in or to, you know, use the skirmish camp to trade some stuff out. There are ways to trade out stuff that you don't like to get the stuff you do want. It's not perfect, but it exists. 
Again, most raids can be soloed by overleveled players. Some can't because of mechanics. Uh, but yeah, very competitive for top kinships to complete it for bragging rights and special titles. But these days, it's no longer the very first group to go through because people were bad and now they took it away. All right, next slide. Uh, we mentioned big battles. Let's go into them a little bit in detail, but not too much detail because there's way too much detail. <coughs> These are scaling instances that feature major battles, although there's two main sets of big battles. There's the Battle for Helm's Deep and the War for Gondor. These are required if you want to complete the epic quest line. Um... The only one that you have to quote unquote buy that's not included with, you know, buying the quest pack is the Battle for Helm's Deep, which is bundled in with the um, Helm's Deep expansion. It actually caused some consternation because that was the first time uh, that any part of the epic battle, or I'm sorry, the epic quest line was hidden behind a paywall that you had to buy that expansion to get that portion of the epic quest line. Uh, and they only did it one other time in Mordor, but other than that, you can get all of the epic quest lines simply by, you know, buying the areas that it's in. <clears throat> <clears throat> Basically, the epic quest line is intended to be completely free to play, but there are a couple of small minor exceptions. Uh, big battles are available at level 10, which can be a little bit confusing, and it can be tougher to play at lower levels for two main reasons. One is you're playing the story out of order, for one thing. Uh, the other is when you're a level 10 character, you only have a few skills. You don't get most of your class skills, your abilities, until you're like level 40 something, right? So unless you have all your goodies, you're gonna have fewer, fewer tools in the toolbox to get through the epic battles. They're available in solo duo, three-person, six-person, and 12-person versions with more mechanics for larger group sizes. Um, what happens is when you choose to participate in this, it'll scale you up to a level 100 for the duration of the battle. <clears throat> but you don't get any of those higher level skills. Like, you don't get your level 40-something skills to play on your character. You just get whatever skills you have at whatever class you are. They just are... the. The skills are scaled up, so if you normally do like 10 points of damage, you do like 150 points of damage, right? That kind of thing. And then once it's over, you go back to being your, your usual self. You could choose one of three roles for the battle and earn progression points, which you might want to do because uh, there are two sets of progression, two scale, two bits of, uh, two, what do you call them? milestones if you get 100 promotion points you get what's called a class trait point you get 200 points you get another one um, you can choose three roles which have nothing to do with what class you can choose these roles based on you know whichever you want to play you can be an engineer to help bolster the actual mechanical defenses build ballistas build defenses you can be a vanguard somebody who goes out there and fights you can be an officer somebody who helps direct other troops and you don't even, honestly, I played through these for the very first time when they first came out. I never even knew that was there. I never played through that content. Uh, I played the battles. I didn't play the roles. But uh, I actually did a, uh, a walkthrough of the Helm's Deep uh, big battle with Chromite. Uh, and he taught me all the really cool stuff of how to, you know, put stuff down and why you'd want to do things a certain way. Uh, to complete because the better you do with these, the better the rewards are going to be. So completing primary and secondary randomly subjected, uh, randomly selected optional objectives will help you achieve uh, medals. They go bronze, silver, gold, platinum with better rewards and reward boxes for the better medals and the amount of the optionals that you manage to complete. Um, I'm going to go back to the game for a second and show you what those screens look like because you can go to the big battle with that so this is the epic battle screen and this is the helms deep one i haven't completed it um, so this is the helms deep stuff 
And they tell you which ones are in which order. So here's one, two, three, four, five. Four, five. And then there's only three for the War of Gondor. And this will help you select which size of group you can be in. Uh, and you can launch it. It will automatically take you to where you need to go. Uh, as you can see on this poor character, I haven't actually done any of this yet. Because I haven't... Uh, this character was boosted, so I haven't gone through the epic quest to get to that point yet. But I can do this at any time if I wanted to. Um, and one of the other things you can do is once you start completing some of this content, you can click there. It's kind of grayed out, but there's like an arrow here where you can forward your rewards to the next tier. So this is bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And then you can cash out your rewards. The roles that I mentioned are designated here. There's the three roles. They're very much like your regular character trait trees that you'll see uh, when we go over the character panel here in a bit. And as you earn more points, you can spend them in these three trait trees. And then as you go through and you know get a certain amount of points in these areas, then the three columns over here on the left start filling in. So I have four points available. You can spend uh, Lotro points to buy promotion points, but they're only come in like sets of 10 and they're really expensive. You can also, um, this is a UI that looks very familiar for folks who we went over, um, well, we'll go over virtues and whatnot. This is a very similar UI. So you have two different sets that you can set up. Like maybe I want to be an engineer and then some other times I want to be an officer. So I can set up a bunch of engineer traits or I can set up a bunch of officer traits. And then you know, if I want to switch around, I can do that. Um, this is basically your progress through all of the epic battles over, as you see, the lifetime of your account or this particular character. And as you see, I haven't done any of them on this character. I can switch to an alt to show you what it looks like. Actually, let me do that real quick. Let me switch to my main because she's been through there. Yeah, Engineer is the most useful solo because you're putting down barricades at, basically, you're doing a bit of crowd control. Let's bounce to my main real quick. If my account wants to log me out, that would be awesome. Once in a great while, you'll click log out and the game won't actually log you out. It happens actually far more often over in uh, Standing Stone's other game, Dungeons & Dragons Online, than it does over here. All right. Let's go to Phoenix, who is at Wood's Edge. So we're going to wind up in the Vales of Anduin. Because I was hanging out with Gandalf at the Bjorning Hoos. Carrying all those flags. Oh my god. <clears throat> and generally during the epic or big battles, the game will tell you what it wants. And it will have uh, icons on the mini-map to sh direct you, point you in the right direction. It's, it's very helpful, uh, but it does uh, help better if you have... Oh, I'm on Wood's Edge. All right, that's where I was. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you what I was doing here. Go watch the VOD. So this is what this character's uh, thing looks like. You see I've got uh, some progress made in each of these. And you notice I can forward my bronze rewards into my silver. And see, is switching to reward cash out will provide the bronze tier rewards instead of contributing to rewards of the next tier. Are you sure you want to change this option? And then it gives you the choice of how you want to do that. <clears throat> and see, the gold and silver, I can't change those two. So basically, as you complete content, it will, you know, it'll contribute differently. So here is how I've set my character up. Uh, I chose Engineer, apparently. And you can see that as 
things progress, I suddenly get this thing over here that opened up, but this unlocked. It's really cool. Yeah, because you don't want copper and silver loot. That's the thing. So, as you can see, I have eight points available, and I've spent 46. And here's my progress. The, these are the ones I've done on this character, which isn't much, quite frankly. Uh, I just did them the minimum amount to get through the epic story. <laughs> so, I have gotten no platinums ever. Two golds, four silvers, three bronzes. And this counts for all of the big battles, all in a sequence. So apparently I've done Pilar gear most of all, and I've done all of the optionals. These are the optionals that you can get uh, for the various options. The, like, And as you notice, the defensive Rohan solo, the Deeping Coom, only has four you know, side quests. The Deeping Wall has four optionals. But the Deeping Wall, if you do it in a raid, has all of these, right? Do you have more people to help you out? So the one I obviously have done the most of is retaking Pilar gear, um, which is actually kind of hard to do solo, but not too difficult. So this is what it looks like on a character who's played some of the content. If you're somebody like Chromite, all of these would be platinum. All these would be filled in because as you run these as a raid, um, it basically keeps track of, did you do it on a solo version? Did you do it on a raid version? Did you do it on a fellowship version? Um, and you get better stuff with the better tiers that you do. I'm going to listen to this beautiful music from Mr. Bill Champagne. <laughs> Flatstone. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to worry about getting attacked because I'm... 130 and this guy is uh, a 120 so he's great to me so he'll he'll ignore me it's fine <coughs> so there's that all right back to the slides hit the right button this time me all right so your rewards can include barter currency jewelry and yes I did spell that correctly because that's how you spell it in game Crafter materials, essences, and mounts do not open any reward boxes until after you leave the instance. And the reason is things scale. If you open within the box, or within the battle, and you're over level 100, it's going to scale to level 100, right? If you're under level 100, you just locked yourself out of any gear that you could use. And yes, as you saw, progress is uh, tracked per character rather than per account. I kind of wish they could do it per account. That would be a nice change of pace. Except some are required to complete the epic quest lines. Alright. Next slide. Are we almost done yet? No! Mounted Combat. Available with the Riders of Rohan expansion at level 75. War steeds level up as you gain experience. Faster than the fastest regular mount. Faster than the stable master mounts, other than the swift travel. Not recommended for tight corners or fenced in areas because they do not stop on a dime. Even when you tell them to stop on a dime. Well, they can stop on a dime if you hit the right button. They do have variable speeds. By default, does not stop without hitting a specific command. But you can disable that uh, in combat options. Their appearance is customizable. You can get light, medium, or heavy war steeds. They are available. The light is the fastest. The heavy is apparently the most durable. You can also get legendary bridles for them. Uh, also light, medium, and heavy. And they have nothing to do with what kind of war steed you're riding. The size of the war steed does matter. Um, if you ride a heavy war steed, it's hot, it's bigger in size than the light war steed. <coughs> and that's, again, not, <coughs> not a bridal thing. That's the type of war steed. Um, light and heavy war steeds are free to VIPs, available for purchase for free-to-play or premium accounts. <coughs> oh, and I said mounted combat UI overview. Well, hey, it's a good thing I've got a war steed right here. <clears throat> hmm, pardon me. 
I'll go back to the game for just a second. Mount of Combat only available in newer zones from Rohan onward. So you can ride a war steed anywhere that you can ride a horse. Except indoors. Um, but you can only fight things in zones beyond Rohan. And war steed skills are more effective if you keep moving due to a mechanic called Fury. So let's hit the the other let's go back to the game. <clears throat> There we are. And uh, you have a thing over here. This is your war steed window. You can move this around however you want. And you click on the horse icon. It brings up your Melta Combat UI. You can also get to it by going to Shift M in your options. Um, and it only appears once you've got your war steed. Shift this Melta Combat. It's one of the things about the options menu is it won't show you things that your character is not eligible for. It's really cool. <clears throat> and as you can see, my UI right there changed to a more Rohiric image. And this is the default game UI. And you see my skills changed a bit. All right. So my War Steed is level 60. It's the highest level of War Steed. Um, here's where my bridle, my legendary bridle is set, and it's a very bad one, because I haven't updated it ev in ever. You can rename your war steed if you want. You can also track your war steed's level with this little icon over here. Right here. And you can move where that is. Um, so this is, this, this is your basic stats for your war steed. How, you know, what its endurance is, and this is one of the big things about Mount of Combat UI that people don't like, is the, the, really, they haven't done much to make War Steeds scale with the rest of the game. So, there is that. Um, they have the turn rate, that's how swift or how quickly they can turn, and you can uh, highlight any of these to get more information. And this is the same as the basic game UI, by the way, it does this as well. <clears throat> so, the bigger the number, the faster it turns. <coughs> Ooh, pardon me. <clears throat> Alright. So, this is the base stats of your war steed. You can also uh, dress up your war steed to make it look different. You can acquire war steed cosmetics through various means in the game, most commonly through festivals. There's some you can buy. There's some, if you buy the mount, you get its, uh, its War Steed cosmetics. And then you can place certain things in certain slots. And then you have these color icons right here that you can adjust. There's some that are automatically unlocked. And there's others, they, you, they sell them in groups of four. And you can unlock them uh, in the Lotro store. It is per character. It is a little bit expensive. So I dressed up this character. I bought the um, the hide color that gets me done, which is the, the Palomino gold color. And I bought uh, what gave me the white. See, that's what it... And you can also preview what the horse would look like if you hover over the color. Right? And there's also a slot for uh, the tail up here. You can also change its color. But me, I always like Palominos, so my main always rides a Palomino. That's it. Um, you can also... Fit gear on it, and the gear is uh, based on body, gear, head, hide, legs, saddle, and tail. So those categories you can get stuff for. Some sets have items for all of these. Some sets don't. Well, um, things for hide and tail are two separate sets, but body, gear, head, uh, legs, and saddle. Some sets have items for all of those. Some sets only have it for, like, you know, the body or the gear. One thing to note, and this is a, a, a point of distress for me, you cannot recolor saddles or the gear piece. 
It makes me really sad because one of my favorite sets in the game is called the Steed of Rivendell set, and it has this beautiful, beautiful um, piece of gear, which looks like this. It has this really beautiful... Uh, packs with the bow and this little lantern with the filigree and I love it and I can't recolor it. I hate that. <clears throat> so I never used that. Which makes me very sad. I wish I could. But uh, undo all. And it will, you can also set it so it doesn't show you the player. You can also have it show you the player. And yep, you can save outfits just like you can for cosmetics. See, there's the other one. And in this case, when you click on the outfit button, it will automatically change it to the other outfit. That's different than the cosmetic outfits for your character. But anyway. So that's War Steeds. And they run really fast and they stop. Um, if you hit the S button while they're running, they will stop. You know, they'll pull up short. But it's not like an immediate like stop right there. Like a, a regular horse will do. Alright, back to slides. We might be getting toward the end of our show, maybe? I hope so. Oh my gosh, maybe not. <clears throat> we mentioned PvMP earlier. That's player versus monster player. You may hear them refer to as Freep versus Creep. Uh, Freep is a member of the Free Peoples. Your regular characters are Freeps. Creeps are the bad guys. They are... Um, the forces of Sauron. And you can fight against regular characters. However, monster classes are free to VIP. Only the Orc Reaver class is free to all. You can only have one character per class per account. So you... Um, per server. Right? So you can only have one Orc Reaver on the Crick Hollow server. If you want another one, you have to create one on the uh, Langeball server, for example. Uh, they are separated from the general landscape, and this is very important. There is no open world PvP in Lord of the Rings Online. That is a bone of contention with the PvP community, and I can tell you uh, quite assuredly, the rest of us like it this way, because whereas you could say reasonably in lore, well, hey, there were orcs in Mordor, why can't we fight the... I'm busy questing, leave me alone. Um, there are two zones you could play in for PvP, PvMP, the Ettenmores and Osgiliath. You can start playing uh, PvMP on everything except the legendary servers. They are not available there at all, um, despite the fact that they are a paid uh, server. Monster classes are available once your account has a single character of any kind up at level 10. Free peoples can travel to the Moors. Or Oscalith at level 20. Both sides will scale to the level cap. So if you have a level 29 hunter and you want to go play PvMP, you go to the Etmore as your character gets scaled to level 130. <clears throat> well, Amorvorn, um, the notion, that's really the main reason why nobody wants PvMP, uh, um, open world PvP. It's because that's what they do in other video games. They they allow it where... <clears throat> and WoW was really bad about this. World of Warcraft. Um, they placed a an epic quest. Their version of an epic quest. Which is a level 120 maximum level quest. In a low level opposite faction zone. Because they have two separate factions. Horde and Alliance. Uh, they placed a horde max level quest in an alliance leveling zone, so all the, the max level horde people would come in and just sit there and one shot all the level. It's bad. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, <clears throat> there are separate mechanics that only partially mirror PvE progressions. So your skills have different names uh, if you're playing a creep side. Um, and there are different features to how. I know what stats your character has. You know, you have, instead of having reputation, you have infamy or renown. 
Um, the landscape graphics automatically set to the lesser quality I've noticed. Um, there is actually a setting in the graphics uh, options of the game where you could tell it to um, not load all the stuff for, you know, when you're in PvP because they're also very known for being very laggy. Uh, over there on the PvP side, if you're on uh, the creep side, that is, you don't have a kinship, you have a tribe. Uh, there is more information if you want to learn more about PvMP uh, here on the link. And uh, I will stinky up the chat with this link. So people can click on it if they like. And that will give you far more in-depth details about monster play. Uh, and uh, I would also recommend the other, pretty much the two most vocal groups of people in the Lodro community in terms of loud minority, your raiders or your PvMP players. Because they're the most competitive, they tend to be the loudest. Sometimes also the most obnoxious. There is that. However, there's some awesome, awesome people who play PvMP as well. Uh, in fact, I killed one of them the last time I stepped in the Enten Moors when our community manager Cordovan went to and did uh, a charity event called Extra Life. He did a segment in where he took his character into the Enten Moors. And one of my friends in the Lonely Mountain Band who has a max level, uh, max rank um, warg, which is one of the classes you can play, uh, he was roaming around and I killed him. I, I felt bad about it, but it's what it is. Uh, but because they're really competitive, sometimes they can seem fairly aggressive to those of us who'd rather just wander on the Shire and, you know, carry pies around. So there's that. Uh, session play, again, I mentioned earlier, and this is really, this is where the magic happens in Lotro. This is what sets Lotro aside from any other MMO that I know of. I could be wrong, but, you know, just the ones that I know of. Session play are solo instances tied to the epic quest line. Um, and they are used to illustrate moments in history or recent events where your character could not be present because it was like a thousand or so years ago. Or, you know, such as um, Isildur accepting the oath at the Stone of Eric, which comes into play in recent content as well. Uh, or the breaking of the Fellowship. You weren't there. Your character cannot be there. It, that's a lore point where it either happened centuries ago or it happened recently, but you cannot have been there. Uh, this is how you can experience those story beats without actually, you know, yourself, your own character being there. <clears throat> uh, they can be repeated at a reflection pool, and those are scattered throughout various places in Middle-earth. There's a list of them on the wiki as well. The point-of-view character will only rarely have the same skills as your actual class. Like, you maybe used to play, be, you know, used to be playing a champion, and your skills are about wielding two swords back-to-back. You may be playing a character with a sword and shield. It makes us old old school champion players sad because we used to be able to carry a shield. Or you may be playing a hunter. Or the skills of your your character will not match one-to-one -to, -one to an actual Lotro class. Some of them are closer than others, but basically you'll want to look at the quest, uh, the actual skills in your quick bar to see what they do. And then, you know, take the time to learn, you know, it's like, okay, well, here's a heal, so I want to do this, you know. And so you just take take a few moments before you actually get into it to figure out what those things do. Or you'd be like me, just butt mash, it'd be fine. And these are the only times in Lotro when you can play as one of the book characters. Now, you're not going to always be a book character during these quests. Sometimes you're playing somebody else tied into the epic quest line, like a character named uh, Lairdin. You play uh, him through a, a session in um, in Aregion, trying to find somebody. <clears throat> and I'm not telling you more because there are spoilers involved. Um, but certain times you can play any member of the Fellowship. During the breaking of the Fellowship stuff, you're going to wind up playing Boromir at one point. You're going to be playing uh, Frodo at one point. Um, during the end of the ring, I'm going to spoil it because I guessed this months before it got released, 
and I kind of upset the quest designer a little bit that I guessed. And he had to sit on his hands and not say that, hey, you guessed. But you get to play as Gollum a couple of times. In fact, the current end game raid involves Shelob. And the music that was originally written for that raid started in a solo session play much earlier, a couple of years ago. Um, actually, closer to three years ago that he featured Gollum betraying Frodo and Sam. That's a lore point, so that's not a spoiler, but you get to play through that in-game. It's so cool! So, that's really, um... The real magic of what makes Lotro different than an other MMO is this right here. Alright. Uh, Deeds. We mentioned Deeds uh, several times through the show already. Uh, Deeds are an extensive system similar to achievements in other games. It's like, you... You know, kill 10, whatever, well, more like 100 or 150 things, you get this reward. You can explore certain locations, like I've explored every nook and cranny of Angmar. Killing a certain number of mobs in a specific location, like kill 20 orcs, or 500 orcs, but you can only do that in Rohan. Or this particular section of Rohan. Orcs in this other part of Rohan don't count. Uh, or completing certain tasks. Um, the default key for the deed log is shift L. So let's go show you the deed log real quick. Shift L. Boop. Hey, look, promotion points. We were just talking about those. <clears throat> and as you can see, the deed log has tabs at the top that will tell you um, what you can do. Let me move it a little bit out of the way because you can, can't really kind of see all of the stuff here. Um, it has tabs at the top for basic regions, like the four main regions of the game, Eriador, Ravania, and Gondor, Mordor. And these up here are for side things, like the story of the war. I haven't done any of those. Or if I have. And this is actually for, uh, oh, it's the Etmores. This is the PvP one. No wonder I'm not done with those. Uh, there's stuff for the hobbies. I only have, there's only one hobby. We'll talk about that. Instances. Um... These are where you go into certain instances. There are certain deeds that you can complete, like the dead that live. You go to this place called Barad Gularan, and you kill 60 people. You get these things. You get a title. You get this reputation. You get Lotro points. Doing deeds is pretty much the, the meat and potatoes of earning Lotro points without spending money for them. You can uh, click Accelerate. This is the Lotro store icon. You can... Basically accelerate it by buying a, a tome off the store. And that makes it so you can advance the deed. Now, deeds have limits on how much you can do in one given day. And the day cycles, I think, resets at uh, 3 a.m. Eastern Time. You can also add deeds to your quest tracker like that. Right? You can also remove it from the tracker. Uh, but it takes away from the num five things that you can put in the quest track. We've we've asked for a separate D tracker. They have not uh, done that. Uh, there are some add-ons that can help you with that. Um, and you have uh, deeds that go through like all of the instances. Like Mines of Moria, Scourge of Kaza Doom. Hey, there's one I'm almost done with. What was that one? Hierarchy of the Nameless. Oh, I haven't completed that quest yet. Um, you can also filter it by set rewards. You can also filter it by whether you've completed it or not. You can also filter it. Well, there's filter all. So, <clears throat> And over here, you also have the group of your class quests. I've basically done all of mine except um, the... Put uh, promotion points one you have your uh, race and social quests like you launch a certain number of green one shot fireworks you get that um, so these are a lot of the festivals are also included in here but also the racial deeds um, this is also where if you for example buy uh, an expansion and one of the higher tiers off the Lotro market for real money. 
you get this one. Like, I bought the Mordor Ultimate Pack, so I get a title for that. Just so I can pull it. Hey, I spent a lot of money. <coughs> so, and these are really cool to, you know, keep track of. And, and again, it'll show you what the rewards were. Like, if you buy the horses or earn the horses, then you mount up, you get, you know, get these titles. Um... This also keeps track of your epic quest lines. Some of them have deeds associated with them. And you complete them and you... Uh, oh, hey, I earned a workman's outfit gift. I didn't realize that. See, I completed this thing and I earned Allies of the King forward. With, I get the title Summoned by Lord Elrond. He summons me a lot. He's like the the uh, the mom who always complains. He never call. He never write. So those are fun. Uh, and there's also the reputation. This is keeps tracks of you know all the various factions you might interact with and what your standing is with them. Um. So those are pretty cool. So the ones for the various regions. Let's pick Ariador <clears throat> because these are the ones you're gonna run across first. And you have these little tags at the bottom, as you, you can see, they're like bookmarks that will let you go into various areas. So this is like the Lone Lands, this is the North Downs. These typically progress based from easiest to hardest, kind of simulating what it would look like in-game as you progress through the game content. It's not quite the same when you hit Robanian because... You do some Ravanian. They, they kind of use the symbol down here to help you, you know, keep track of what's going where. So it's like you got Lothlorien. You've got Moria. You got the lower deeds, the, you know, various bits of Moria. And then you got this one. It looks a little bit different. This is Southern Mirkwood. But it looks like this, this, the, the bookmark looks the same like these other bookmarks. Because these are Northern Mirkwood. So these are basically, and the Veils of Anduin, and, you know, the Dwarf Holds and the Iron Mountains. But these look like Rohan. Well, they don't, it doesn't quite progress. I mean, they progress in level left to right. Uh, but the symbols are based on which area they're in. And the Gondor ones are all Gondor, and then you've got Mordor. Well, that's the waste. Then you got Mordor. Looks different. Mordor only has two spots. It has the original Gorgoroth content from the original Mordor expansion two years ago. And then there's the Minas Morgul expansion that just launched in November, this past November. And I imagine as they add more to the game, they'll add more of these. I'm hoping. So there's your deed log. It's really cool. All right, back to slides. Arr. Back to slides. Where are my slides? There are my slides. Some deeds, uh, let's see. <clears throat> some deeds are hidden and don't appear in the log until you've completed some or all of it. Like a lot of the festival deeds won't show up until you've completed the first tier of the deeds. Say, hey, there's a deed for this. Um, there's some that don't appear until you've completed the entire deed. I think the Blind Leaper is not one of those. Um, deeds can, re as you saw, can reward titles, lotra points. Some of them, uh, give you emotes, cosmetics, virtue XP, legendary item XP, reputation, items, mounts, racial traits, or skills. Deeds tend to have minimum levels before they will bestow and require a player to have purchased the area where the deed is based before it will become available. And I will note to you right now. While Lotro is in that um, all quest content is available to all players until April 30th thing, deeds are included in those unlocks. Uh, Red Panda posted that this morning on the Lotro forums. I love that guy. <clears throat> he is so cool. Uh, he is uh, one of our marketing team. Our by Standing Stone. Again, I don't work for Standing Stone. He's one of the Standing Stone marketing team people. Um, and he is very player focused. He wants to do more for players. Sometimes he has to say no. Um, but 
he did acknowledge that deeding is included for the most part with this unlocked content period. So if you want to do deeds, now's the time to do them if they're in areas that you have you don't already own. So that's really cool. <clears throat> Again, some, uh, it, but you have to also be of a, the close enough minimum level for the area. You can't say take a level 8 character here to the Vales of Anduin and get the Anduin deeds because she's she's going to be too far under level. And again, some deeds are only available during limited time events such as festivals. Crafting can be used to create gear, consumables, housing items, and cosmetics. There are seven vocations with three pre-selected professions in each one. So for example... Uh, my character, let me go take a look and see what she is. She is a an explorer by vocation. So the three professions assigned to explorers are tailoring, forestry, and prospector. And no, I'm not going to show you the game. Crafting could be its own separate stream. Uh, we're not really going to get too much into detail about crafting. I do have a paper I wrote about crafting once upon a time. I might inflict that upon you. I might drop it in the Discord for people to read if you want more information about crafting. It's a little bit out of date. I think I wrote it two years ago. I think it's up to Mordor content. I don't think I took it beyond Mordor. So it's relevant up to Mordor, not into current content. <coughs> but that's what it is. Um, so by design, um, two of the three... Uh, professions that you will get when you pick a vocation are interrelated. You can use the stuff you acquire in one to do the actual crafting in the other. The third one is deliberately not related to the other two. So it's to encourage trading amongst players. Like, well, uh, I as an explorer, I can you know provide hides and make hides that work with tailoring. But as a prospector, there's nothing my prospecting is going to do to help me be a tailor, but I can sell those ores, those ingots, to other players and, and you know, get some stuff that I need for tailoring. <clears throat> um, you can pick up crafting as soon as you get done with your character starting instance. There are currently 12 tiers of crafting that result in higher items, uh, higher level stuff, the higher the tier is. Most of them, other than cooking, you're generally not going to do a lot of backtracking on, oh, I need this lower level tier, lower tier item to work on my higher level uh, result. There's a couple of things where you use some um, some prospecting to smelt certain alloys that you need for a higher tier. But for the most part, it's meant that this tier is separate from this tier is separate from this tier. Uh, crafters use recipes to create set items with specific sats assigned to them. Some recipes are harder to acquire than others. Uh, some require reputation. Uh, for example, uh, this is especially bad in uh, the Mirkwood, Southern Mirkwood and Rohan content is your character needs to have a certain reputation with the local factions in order to buy their crafting recipes or to use their crafting recipes. Crafting requires ingredients gathered throughout the game with certain more difficult items requiring success in group play. Like um, a lot of current endgame stuff. Uh, for the past couple of years required if you really wanted the really good crafting stuff, you had to go raid. Simple as that. Uh, upon succeeding to the third tier of crafting, which is expert, which is... Uh, I can't tell on this character. Basically, fairly low level content. Um, remember expert being somewhere less than level 30. Um... Players may join crafting guilds to earn reputation and buy improved or legendary recipes. And crafting guilds are their own separate enchilada as well. Again, if you want more information on that, uh, I can post the document in the Discord. It's uh, just a Word document with some screenshots. Uh, I actually wrote it as a crafting 101 tutorial for Cordovan once upon a time. 
took him like two months to read it. <clears throat> and you now can join two crafting guilds, but it depends on which vocation you choose. Crafting guilds only apply to cooking, weaponsmithing, woodworking, tailoring. And I'm sure I'm forgetting one. Chat, help me out here. But basically, you have to be making something. You're not just gathering stuff. Um, you have to be making something. I think the only one where you make something that doesn't have a craft guild is farming. Um, and then that has its own separate reputation. Like, you have to earn reputation with your crafting guild to buy those better recipes. Armor. Thank you, Dragon Rider. appreciate you. All right. But crafting is a whole separate segment of gameplay. Uh, I could do a whole lecture on just crafting, but we're not going to because it's almost, it's actually seven o'clock. <laughs> We've been going for three hours. Okay, allegiances. Uh, allegiance is optional content in the Mordor expansion available at level 110. There are four allegiances, dwarf, elf, hobbit, and man. And characters can do all four regardless of your race. The first one leveling up uh, goes the most quickly, and then it takes longer for each subsequent one until you've done all four. Each allegiance includes story content for that particular group. So the dwarf one, uh, you're working with the dwarves of Erebor, the Lonely Mountain. The elf one, you're talking to uh, Celeborn and Galadriel, uh, dealing with Lothlorien. Uh, the hobbit one, you're dealing with Merry and Pippin. And the men, I believe you are talking to... Um, actually, I don't think there is a man for that one. Because you're not going to be talking to King Elisar. He's kind of busy. But you're talking to one of his uh, subjects. Allegiance content uh, rewards barter currency that can then be traded for gear useful in Mordor. Uh, all four have convenient ports with a short cooldown for a quick way to Mordor. In fact, you saw me use one earlier on the stream when I went to Lothlorien for a second and then went to Mordor. <clears throat> and that little icon that you saw, which is right next to my minimap in the upper right hand corner, was my allegiance uh, reputation indicator. <gasps> Last link! Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo! Last slide! All right. <clears throat> so, that is the primary gameplay loop of Lord of the Rings Online. I know I threw a lot of content at you. It's three hours of, of stuff. And there's a lot more that I, can, I could talk about, about all of those things. Uh, normally, this is the part where I'd ask if, uh, if anybody had any questions... Uh, the folks that I know in chat, some of them actually know more about this stuff than I do, and I'm very grateful for their assistance and, and uh, corrections and stuff in chat. If you have questions that have not been answered by uh, asking around uh, or doing a deep dive in Lotro Wiki, that's the second uh, fan-run site right there, um, then definitely drop, uh, drop that question in the Lotro 101 channel in our signum you discord and i will try my very best to get you an answer also right now the question is whether i should speed up the pace and get more of these classes out uh, for right now because the quest content is available however we still have to get through the secondary optional content which is next week's class let me give you a preview of next week's class this is cool there are more things than heaven and earth Secondary gameplay loops. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to start with festivals next week. <clears throat> so, if you have questions you want to throw to the, the generic, uh, the general Lotro community, the Lotro forums are a good place for that. By good, I mean possibly good, possibly not. If you have any issues with the game itself or you want to ask a question directly of the developers... They may or may not answer it. You can put in a bug report at help.standingstonegames.com. There's also uh, help files to answer, you know, frequently asked questions and whatnot there. Uh, you can also drop in uh, anytime that twitch.tv slash LotroStream is live. Uh, our community manager, Cordovan, normally streams Fridays at noon Eastern from noon to one. He's right before Corey's Grifflet streams. Uh, and... He is the one Standing Stone employee that streams on that channel. Everybody else is a player volunteer like me. So we can help answer questions about the game, but we are not Standing Stone Games ourselves. 
we cannot speak for the company. We don't represent the company. Just like, even though I'm on the Signum U channel, I don't represent Signum University. Um, <clears throat> but one thing we do have that I love about Lotro is we have a freaking awesome, helpful community. And on the Lotro stream channel specifically, one of the tasks uh, or one of the goals that myself and our channel runner, Eldaleth, who's one of our mods here, is... We have basically decided to, amongst ourselves in Cordovan lets us do this, make it a place where people can come and ask questions and get answers. Not, oh, why is the raid tier working? Like, like if you're new to the game and you want to learn how to play, you can ask your newbie questions without judgment, without being turned away on the official Lodro channel uh, when somebody's streaming there. And I stream there uh, Fridays, Supposed to be from 3 to 6 right after Cory, Unless I get my teeth into a really big meaty piece of content and wind up streaming till 9 like I did last night. <clears throat> but we definitely try to make it to be a welcoming place. Uh, it is a family friendly channel much like this one. Um, you know, no cussing, no treating people like, you know, don't be a jerk, don't be a troll. Um, you know, be respectful. Even if you're, you're upset about something... You can, you say you're upset about something in the game, but don't call the developer an idiot kind of thing. It's like, I really hate how they made this, but the developer's okay, you know, that kind of thing. So separate what you dislike about the game and don't make it personal. Um, we also have amazing members of our fan community as well. Um, the one right here, the first fan run site is a gentleman by the name of Fibro Jedi. Uh, he does these really cool beginner's guides. He actually has a crafting guide that may be of help. Uh, he also is the number one source for information about the various festivals in-game. About, uh, like, the spring festival is on right now. He has, uh, he, the first thing he does is despite, you know, he, he's got some challenges to overcome, some obstacles to overcome to be able to present those, you know, to, to go in-game and get this stuff sorted for us. But he makes that sacrifice for us, so I, you know, I gave him a massive shout out the other day, and um, he's an awesome, awesome person. I knew him from the Star Wars: uh, The Old Republic community, and he's a really nice guy. Uh, there's also the Lotro Wiki, which is a fan-run wiki. Uh, not none of the fan-run sites are in any way officially uh, endorsed or run by Standing Stone. These are all community-based efforts. Um, I myself did my first contribution to the Lotro Wiki last night. It was. Well, actually, I did it this afternoon, but it was for a quest I did last night. It was so cool. <clears throat> and the wiki has a lot of information. It's not complete. It's not comprehensive. But it's a damn good site um, to look for stuff. So if you're stuck on a quest, there's where you want to go. I mean, you can ask around on the forums, but the wiki is going to be your number one resource in that. And that concludes lesson three. So next week... Uh, we're going to go into lesson four with our secondary gameplay loops. One thing about that is I will actually need to go pretty quickly through that one because I have an appointment at six o'clock um, next Saturday. So thank you for being here. Um, the next stream here on the Signum U channel is we may have Girls of mid Earth on Sunday. If we don't, <clears throat> then Exploring Lord of the Rings on Tuesday with Professor... No. Um, the Pokemon Discovery Project on Tuesday, the Pokemon Professor first, and then we'll have Professor Corey that evening. But we may have the Girls of Middle Earth, so check out our schedule, which will appear on the screen. I made that graphic, so if you hate it, that's my fault. I'll, I take the blame. If you liked it, I answer. I worked off of our good friend Aerithart, my predecessor's um, original uh, template, so really cool. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate you. And uh, as I like to say on my own streams, you know, if you can't be good, be good at it. Have a great day. Hope everybody's staying safe. Um, you know, following governmental guidelines and rules and laws to keep yourself, your family, and other people and their families safe from the current crisis uh, running across the globe. I hope everybody's doing as well as you can. Uh, and play some Lotro if you can. If not, if you have questions before you want to play, uh, toss them to me in Discord. And yes, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Uh, I touch my face all the time, but I live alone with a cat, so I'm pretty good. So wash your hands. 
take your shower, do what you can to stave off the, the fire. Hey, and come play some Lotro with us. We'd love to have you. Uh, if you want to be added to the uh, Mythgard kinship on either Landreval or Honor, drop me a note uh, in the Signum U Discord or just drop me a DM in Discord. And if I'm not uh, away from keyboard or presently engaged in something else, which is very rare, uh, I can log in and get you set up. Or if you need the Mythgard kin tag in Discord, let me know that too so I can get you rolled so you can see our uh, Mythgard kin channel. So have a great day and be good. And if you can't be good, be good at it. I will see you next week, if not sooner. Thank you.